Hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if female Deku had his mom quirk part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content and live a like. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Crazyjack underscore the gachatuber 15 from Al3. So let's start the video. Hey, what quirk do you think we will have? Hopefully something like Mom or All Might. I want something like All Might. I want something like Mommy. Izumi turns away with a huff. He didn't understand why she didn't want a quirk like their mother's. Her quirk is very cool and useful in almost all situations. Their mother sighs from where she was sitting beside Izumi. Wait, I'm sorry Mommy. Izumi immediately apologized as Mom laughed. Don't worry, Izumi. You're not in trouble. Izumi sighs in relief as he looks in the direction of the doctor who left the room with the blood in it. Yagi. Mom stands up and grabs our hands as she leads us to the doctor's office. So, what did you find? She asked as she sat them down before sitting herself. The doctor sighed before looking at her. So, I'm going to be blunt. Your son is quirkless. His mother sucks in a breath as he freezes. He knew what that word meant, unlike his sister that looked confused. But, on the bright side, your daughter appears to have a stronger version of your quirk. The doctor exclaims with a bright smile. Izumi pouts. It isn't All Might's quirk. She crosses her arms as their mother thanks the doctor and leaves out. How ironic. They're both sad but, for different reasons. He didn't have a quirk while she didn't get the quirk she wanted. He wanted to cry and by some miracle. He hasn't yet. The drive home was silent. Mom looked to be in deep thought. He looked out of the window. He couldn't be a hero without a quirk, could he? He could try, but it would be hard. When they get home Izumi runs out of the car crying. Daddy, I didn't get All Might's quirk. Dad was standing at the door and easily caught her. Oh no, what did you get, Angel? Izumi just sobs harder as he and Mom walk in. Honey, Izuku's quirkless. Father didn't say anything but he tensed up. Izuku didn't know what that meant and only started heading in the direction of his room. As he left the living room he heard his mother's next words. But, Izumi luckily got a stronger version of my quirk. She sounded so happy. He couldn't take it, and ran the rest of the way to his room and broke down. All the tears he was holding back all came out like a gesture. He could hear the sound of his parents celebrating Izumi on her new quirk. No one came to check up on him that night. The next day he sat on the bench on the playground. He was watching everyone play as his usual playmates weren't here currently. Izuku, I heard you are quirkless. He turned to see Kakin and Sukin there, both of their palms sparking. He nodded slowly. His voice was hoarse due to him crying himself to sleep. Are you still planning on being a hero? He turns to look at Shoko. He thought about her question for a few seconds. He assumed they took his silence as a yes. Because the next thing he knew Izumi started yelling at him, saying it was too dangerous for a quirkless loser. What? He blinked in confusion. Boo, isn't it dangerous for everyone? Quirk or no quirk? He was interrupted by an explosion from Suchin. No talking back loser. They all then gave him a not very brutal beating. But it was still bad. The rest of the day continued like that. He was confused by why they suddenly started treating him like that. They said he couldn't be a hero due to not having a quirk, but could they be heroes if they become bullies? Well, they could be like Endeavor. He's the Todoroki twin's father anyway. Izuku slowly made his way home. Izumi left without him with the Bakugu twins. When he got home he ran into mom. Izuku. What happened to you? She bent over and picked him up. I I. I fell on the way home. Mom nodded and went to look for the first aid kit. He leaned against her chest as he went to sleep. It's been a year since then. And Izumi and her friends have made it their life's mission to beat him at least once a day. He can't avoid them at school because he lives with Izumi. So, they would either just get him at home or give him twice the beating the next day. But that's not the only thing that happened this year. Ever since the day they went to the court doctor, he noticed his parents seemed to forget about him more and more. Like the day they went Christmas shopping and forgot to tell him. Or that day, they all went on a trip to Tokyo, but forgot to take him. Or that time mom only made three plates and forgot his so. He had to make himself his own plate. And that was only scratching the surface. He feels like this is going to become an issue in the future. Like he went with his mother to the park today. And he feels like she doesn't even know he's been with her for the last hour. He sighs as he bounces his favorite red ball. He will just have to get used to it, 
if this is going to be his new norm. He throws the ball down. Maybe he should get himself a cookbook, just in case. He throws the ball again, but it goes too high and bounces away. He immediately chases after it. It was his favorite red ball after all. He watches it bounce until it is caught by a man with white hair and freckles. Hello, little one. Is this your ball? Izuku nodded and smiled brightly. It is thank you, mister. He grabbed his ball back and was about to run over to his mother when he felt a prick on the back of his neck and the world went dark. Warning some things that aren't for good for the heart and mind children being tortured. Violence against children. Accidental murder. Murder. Human experimentation on children. Skip these sections if you don't want to be potentially triggered. Hey, brat. Tuizuku was barely holding on to. Go to sleep was code for. Takatashi closed his eyes. He immediately grabbed the man. Actually, just skip that whole paragraph. Tilda. Tilda Tilda. Tilda Tilda. Tilda the first thing he saw when he woke up was a roof that didn't look like the one in his room. He groaned as he felt his head begin to pound from the bright lights. Did Izumi leave them on? He quickly closed his eyes before opening them slowly. The roof still looked the same. He slowly leaned up and took in his surroundings. He was in a cage in the center of a white room. A brightly lit white room. He didn't get a chance to observe further because he heard someone speak up behind him. Anaki, he's awake. We can see that Amya. Lower your voices. Sorry, he turns to see four kids behind him. They were all dressed in oversized dirty white shirts. And when he looked down he saw he was wearing one too. Though his shirt was cleaner than theirs was. Most likely because he was just taken here. He stopped observing himself to instead observe the four other kids with him. It was two boys and two girls. They all seemed to be around his age, with the boy who shushed them looking to be the oldest around eight or seven-ish. Hey, are you quirkless too? Izuku blinked. Yes too? Are you all quirkless? They all nod. He couldn't hold back his surprise. To be born quirkless is rare in their generation. He didn't ever expect to meet one, let alone four, other people born quirkless. Though surprise and tiny bits of joy were shattered by what they said next. They only kidnap children with no quirk to experiment on them. Izuku lets out a gasp of horror. Experiment? He whispered to himself. Human experimentation is a crime, isn't it? But quirkless people are seen as less than human. So, would other people even care if they tried to search for help? He looks down. He wonders if mom was looking for him. Was she running around the neighborhood, screaming out his name in panic? Was she asking if anybody's seen him? Has she called the police to report that he's missing? Or did she not care? Or worse, did not even notice he was gone? He's basically worth less than scrap food to him. She has Izumi after all. She was a good one, she had a quirk, and she would be the one to go out and make their parents proud. With her around, there is no need to think about their quirkless son. His spiraling thoughts were interrupted by a voice. Hey, what's your name? It was the older looking one. He had blonde hair and black eyes. He looked pretty thin but, then again so did all of them. They must not get a lot of food here. I'm Izuku Yagi. Call me Izuku. Izuku answered honestly as he looked at his palms. Okay, I'm Katashi Keo, he pointed at the girl who spoke up first. That am I Ariko. She had short purple hair with teal streaks and white eyes. She was about his height maybe. He isn't sure as she's sitting down. Hi. She had a nice smile, Izuku decided. He nervously waved back at her. Hi. Katashi smiled and pointed at the other boy. That is Akihiro Masajiro. He was sleeping so Izuku couldn't see his eyes, but he could see his white hair. He also appeared to be taller than Izuku. Katashi then poked the girl who responded to what Riko-san said before. And this one is Azami Tatsuki. Azami. So close to Izumi. He took a deep breath as he felt lucky that she looked nothing like his sister. Azami had long red hair and blue eyes. Interesting. Feel free to call us by our first name as well, Katashi said as he crawled over to Izuku. You might want to get some more sleep before they come back in an hour. I guess you can say you lucked out as they don't experiment during dinner time. He slowly moved Izuku to the corner before he went over to Amiya who was nodding off now. Izuku thought about it before curling into a ball and going back to sleep. Asterisk trigger warning asterisk, hey, the new brat. Fucking wake up. The boss is waiting for you. Someone's voice rudely cut through his pleasant dreams as he felt someone grab the back of his shirt. He instinctively reached up, but lowered his hand, the same way he does when Sucken does it too. 
He saw Katashi give him a look of pity before he was dragged out of view. He had an idea. What meeting the boss meant. He was dragged down a long hallway before being taken into a room. He couldn't read what was written on the door. It was more complicated than what he was learning in school. The room was designed similarly to the one he woke up in. It was all white. The only difference was that it smelled like a hospital room. He knew based on what Katashi said earlier. This is where they experiment on them. He was then thrown on the metal table. The air got knocked out of his chest from how hard that man threw him. Before he moved an inch, he chained down and gagged. He could see the man who dragged him now. He looked unremarkable but was dressed in all black with some goggles on his head. There you quirkless piece of shit. The man muttered before leaving the room as a man in a lab coat came in. This was the boss, and he could already tell. He wasn't going like either him or what will happen next. Normally we would electrocute you on your first day, but we don't need to free you. After all, you've been exploded, frozen, burned, and thrown all over the place by those around you. So, you've had enough quirk shock, and we can jump right into the good stuff. His eyes widened. How did the doctor know about this? How long was he tailing him? Did he ever follow him home? He said those around you. Not your sister and ex-friend so. He doesn't know his relation to them. His eyes started tearing up. Then was this something unavoidable? Don't cry now. The fun hasn't even begun yet. The man said as he walked over to a machine and started pressing a few buttons. The machine above him whirled to life with a low whistle as needles came down and pricked him. He winced as his noises of pain were muffled by the gag. Now this is going to hurt. Pink stuff began to flow down the tubes connecting to the needles as a maniac smile appeared on the man's face. A lot, Izuku's eyes bulged as he screamed with all of his lungs. Not even the gag could muffle his screams as tears freely fell down his face as he tried in vain to thrash around. Trying to do something, anything, to escape the pain, but it only made it hurt more. It hurts, were the only thoughts that could flood his brain. He could barely keep any other thoughts for less than a second. It hurt more than anything he's ever felt in his life. More than when Shoto accidentally gave him frostbite. More than when Kaken's palm exploded while he was holding his hand. More than when Izumi threw him into a tree when she couldn't control the strength of her quirk. And the sound of his screams only made the man smile more, taking sick pleasure in the pain he caused him. I could go to sleep or even jack off to these screams. He moaned, though it didn't reach Izuku's ears over the sound of him screaming. After an hour, the pink stuff stopped coming in the tube, and he almost let out a sigh of relief. His voice was hoarse from all his screaming, his vision made blurry by the tears flowing down his face. His eyes were what are hurting the most for some reason as he didn't inject anything into his eyes. He was breathing heavily as he heard the doctor speak up. Don't relax too much, now. I have to do something first. He then walked over to Izuku and moved behind his head. He grabbed his face and held his left eye open. So, they went there first. How interesting. He then pulled out a syringe with no needle and poured half of the blue stuff into his eyes, causing his vision to colored blue for a second. He then went and did the same thing to his right eye before walking about to his post. Izuku blinked for a second as he tried to take in his surroundings properly as his vision turned purple. The blue stuff caused his eyes temporary relief before they began to burn. It felt like someone fired a laser into his eyes. Now, let's see. We need to use the menstrual fluid next. He heard the sound of something going down the types after the sound of a button being pressed rang out. Are you ready for round two? He thought he couldn't scream anymore after the first round. But, as soon as he felt the needles resume their original position he screamed. It was just as loud as before. He would be surprised if he still had his voice by the time they were done. Unlike the first round where he felt like he was being repeatedly electrocuted, this time he felt like he was being burned from the inside out. His hands felt tingly like they were buzzing, and his head began to pound as if the fires were there too. He didn't know what felt worse, this round or the previous one. This round only lasted 30 minutes, but he could sense there was more coming. The fluid changed again. He knows this cause now it felt like his insides were being doused in water. He tried to take a deep breath, but the gag was blocking most of the air. If this round wasn't necessary, I would have taken it out. Too boring. He heard the madman whisper into himself. He bit down on the gag to steady himself. He tried seeing what parts of his body he could move. He tried his foot first. He couldn't move them, so he tried his hands. He could only clench his fist once before he was too tired. Finally done. Just four more rounds to go. Four more rounds. 
four more rounds of torture, at the hands of this mad doctor? Or would mad scientists be more appropriate? He didn't get a chance to think about it more as his vision finally cleared up and could see a black fluid going down the tube. He tried to prepare himself as the syringes filled with the black fluid. His voice was hoarse. He couldn't scream, but if he could it would be just as loud as the last two times. He felt like he was being repeatedly stabbed over and over all over his body. He tried to jump and move to avoid the sensation, but couldn't move because he was chained to the table. He thought round four lasted for two hours, but when the sensation stopped he realized he was going into round six already. The fluids in the syringe were no longer black, but were a light gray. The needles let his body causing him to let out a muffled hiss. The machine turned and moved out of his range of sight. He heard a few weird noises. Did his hearing get better? The machine came back. It looks like it switched out the syringes, as they were a little bigger than before. And filled with a teal substance. Why did he need to change the syringes for this one? The machine then quickly lowered itself and plunged the needles back into him. He's not going to get used to that sensation today, but, hopefully, will soon. He's going to be here a while. As the teal stuff entered his body, he realized it felt heavy. As if someone had all might sit on him. Speaking of all might, he wonders if his mom told his father yet. Did they notify the police about him being kidnapped? But, he knew even then, help isn't on the way. The chances of them even searching are low. According to Katashi, only quirkless kids were taken. The police wouldn't even bother looking. Why were his thoughts so negative all of a sudden? Was it this teal stuff? He couldn't muster the strength to put more thought into it as the rest of the teal liquid entered his body. He watched as the tubes were then filled with a pure white fluid, and it didn't even stop for a second before the stuff was entering him too. He felt calm now. It didn't burn or anything. It felt like he was floating on clouds. It honestly made him feel sleepy, but he tried to hold onto his consciousness. Quite the stubborn one, aren't you? I am expecting great things from you, Yagi. Don't disappoint me like you did your family. That was all the doctor said as the machine lifted and turned off. Asterisk trigger warning over Asterisk Izuku was barely holding onto his consciousness when the guard from earlier entered the room and unshackled him before dragging him back into the room he woke up in. He was thrown into the cage. He couldn't even muster the strength to lift himself. He heard shuffling before he felt his head being lifted. He wanted to turn and see who was touching him, but his vision went blurry whenever he tried. They started the experiment right away. He could barely recognize the voice as Katashi's voice now. Everything was blurry. Don't worry, go to sleep. I'll keep you safe until you wake up. And that was all it took before he let go and returned to the darkness. Praying for his family to save him soon. Tilda. Tilda Tilda. Tilda Tilda. Tilda, yeah, I get it, Mitsuki. Izumi is having trouble controlling her quirk, and I'm the only one who can help her. But what if I'm neglecting Izuku's health and needs in the process? Inko was cooking dinner while on the phone with her best friend. She had gone to the park to clear her head when she got a call from Mitsuki saying she dropped Izumi off from her sleepover with the twins. She could hear Mitsuki sigh over the phone. They had been at first talking about simple things before the topic shifted to their kids, and she ended up dumping all her worries onto Mitsuki again. It's just she's noticed that she barely has any memories of Izuku after she took him to that doctor, which made her worry that she unintentionally started neglecting him after finding out that he was quirkless. She didn't want the reveal to impact their relationship that badly, and she was hoping Tashinori would be able to sit down and talk with Izuku as he was formerly quirkless himself. Speaking of Izuku, where is he? He's usually in the kitchen beside her helping in any way he can at his young age. She frowned as she put the baked macaroni into the oven. Tashinori loves this and had asked for her to cook some tonight. She walked out of the kitchen after asking Mitsuku to wait a moment and poked her head into the living room. Hey, honey. Yes, Inko? He asked from where he was on the floor with Izumi going through a book of superheroes. Inko giggled at the sight. Do you know where Izuku is? Tashinori shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. He's probably hiding away in his room again. Inko nodded and decided to take that answer as Izuku has done that before. She walked back to the kitchen and picked up the phone. Sorry about that, Mitsuki. But, do you have any advice? Yes, I thought about it while bonking those brats on their heads. Inko's sweat dropped. She hoped Mitsuki didn't think of anything violent. And that the twins' heads don't hurt too much. You just need to start hanging out with him more. How about one day you take him out and have some mother and son bonding time? Talk to him about his interests. 
and help him engage in his hobbies. Something like that. Inko nodded as she mentally wrote all of that down. Wow, you're so smart, Mitsuki. Yeah, I am just naturally that talented. Now go before you forget about the food. They exchange short goodbyes before she focuses on the food in the oven. Maybe they could go to the new All Might Cafe that opened not too far from where his school is. And she could buy him some more journals to write down his hero notes in. She should be more scared by how smart her son is. And he has no quirk meaning it is all natural. But, no, instead she's surprised he hasn't realized that she's Green Empress. Because after seeing her section in his notebook, she thinks he would have connected the dots by now. Or maybe he's already figured it all out, and is just staying quiet about it. She opens the oven to see that the ham is done, and the macaroni will be done in a few minutes. Tashinori, set the table please, she shouted as she heard him shout back okay. She pulls out the ham using her quirk and decides to talk to Izuku when he leaves his room and to leave his plate in his mini-fridge. Yes, her son has a mini-fridge. She bought it when he stopped coming down for dinner, as often as she worried he wasn't eating. Mmm, something smells good, Tashinori says as he walks into the kitchen and grabs the plates. Is that baked ham? Yes, now set the table so you can eat, Inko responded with a smile as she flicked the spoon in his direction. Yes, ma'am. He said before leaving with the plates. Inko's smile and her adorable family caused that issue with Izuku to slip from her mind. Over the last three weeks, Izuku's gotten accustomed to the routine here. Wake up to Azami getting taken at six in the morning. Lays around talking to the others, Azami comes back at nine. Five minutes later they take Katashi. He comes back at twelve, and they are all given a single bowl of rice and an hour of free time together. At one Ami gets taken and comes back at four. Five minutes later they come and take Akihiro, who Izuku found out has purple eyes. Akihiro comes back at seven. Then they come back five minutes later for him. He doesn't know what time he comes back, as he usually goes to sleep immediately after he returns. Though according to Katashi he takes the longest to return. And he also said that when he gets back they all get a bowl of rice and fried fish. He gets to each his in the morning, as he's knocked out due to drugs when they hand it out. And also over the week, he got close to his four cellmates. Azami luckily is nothing like Izumi, and he wishes she was his sister instead. Though he does wonder if she's related to the Todoroki family in some way, she shares features with Endeavor. Like her hair and eye color for example, but, back to Azami, she's nice, but very sarcastic. She seems to be a show, rather than tell type of person. Katashi radiates big brother energy, and they all call him Aniki. That makes him happy, he doesn't have a brother. He has an older sister, but, she's not the best. He looks over all of them, and has been here the longest. He estimates he's been there for a little over a month. He talked about his family a lot and said that if he wasn't quirkless, he would have been found by now. He says his parents didn't care about diagnosis and still showered him with the same love and care as before. He told them that he wants to find a way to advocate for better care for quirkless people as the fact they haven't been found yet is stupid. Amaya is like the moon to his son. Katashi's words, not his. He has no idea what that means. She's very energetic, but only when the guards aren't around. When they are nearby, she's quiet and plays with people's hands. She is very physically affectionate, giving them hugs all the time. She's a little smarter than his sister, so she's pretty smart. Akihiro is very, um, rude, nice. He's like a combination of Shoto and Kaken, but in a good way. He's quiet and soft-spoken, but spits fire in every word he says. He is very funny though, so he wins automatically. After telling everyone about his home life, Akihiro told him that his mother hasn't forgotten him either. Azami did tell him to stop calling Kaken. Kaken. Because they aren't his friends anymore when they are being physically and verbally abusive. And that he should stop considering them as his family but shouldn't stop considering her as his sister. Which confused him if she's his sister then doesn't that mean she's family? He heard the sound of the cage opening and turned to see that one of the guards had entered the cage and was reaching toward Katashi. Izuku tensed up. Katashi already went today. They just had lunch. Katashi wasn't even looking because too busy looking at Azami who was sleeping on his lap. He couldn't be reaching for Amiya as she was sleeping beside him. He accidentally spoke aloud. No, he can't. He can't get his words out as his tongue felt like lead in his mouth. He tried to swallow down his fear as the guard turned to him. Katashi looked up and shakes his head rapidly. His face was one of terror, but not for himself. 
Oh, are you talking to me? The guard started walking towards him. Wait. He doesn't. Katashi speaks up as Azami seems to have sensed the mood as she starts to wake up. Aye aye, yes. He said nervously, fighting the urge to look away. He knows looking away would make him angrier. Oh, you're talking back now. Seems like you need to be retrained. How about we take you early to give you the needles you love? The guard leans over and grabs him. When he touches him, Izuku screams as a red light fills the room. Tiny red boxes appear in the air and go through the guard and go through the ceiling. The fear of being forced to go through that early. And the terror of knowing it will be worse since he made the guard angry. Forced him to use the thing he's been keeping secret from them since the second day. Eraser, look at that light. Midnight shouts to Eraserhead who's already running in the direction the light came from. He could see little tiny boxes mixed in the light if he squinted. It's most likely a rogue quirk. He tried to dismiss it as nothing more than that. But if one thing he's learned in his years as a hero is that everything is more than what it seemed. He slipped on his goggles, just in case. At this time of night, Midnight didn't believe that, despite it being a logical assumption. But it was coming from an area that's been abandoned for years. Only villains stay there, attempting to hide from heroes like them. I'm coming to Eraser. Miss Joke shouted as she followed them as they raced across the rooftops. Midnight, call for backup, he shouted at her. She nodded and tapped her calm's piece. At this time of night, an out-of-control quirk means nothing good. Eraserhead grits his teeth as he quickened his pace hoping no one was hurt. The guard falls dead. If he was alive Izuku would be impressed, as there's a giant gaping hole in his chest. Katashi, Akihiro, and Azami look horrified. Izuwa, the alarms started blaring as more guards rushed in. All this commotion woke up Amiya who looked around confused until her eyes landed on the dead guard. Get him and follow Procedure Blue. The head guard shouts as they enter the cage. Procedure blue. They knew what that was, and they had a plan for when it eventually happened. It means to take out the one who manifested a quirk and guard the others. But they didn't know their experiments worked, and they all had quirks now. And they all planned to keep them a secret until an opportunity came up for them to escape. The guards grab him and drag him out as he gets close to the door he shouts. Anarchy. Don't wait for me. Go to sleep. Go to sleep was the code they came up with. Breakout Plan C. Plan C was made in case one of them revealed their quirks. The others were to use the chaos to their advantage to break out. This was the plan they all hated the most. They would have to abandon the one who got caught. They're honestly lucky they even managed to come up with one plan, let alone multiple, considering they were being guarded and watched constantly. They looked out because the guards are lousy and only enter the room when someone needs to be sent to the lab. He sees Katashi tense up but he was taken out of view before he could see what decision he made. He was dragged down a familiar hallway until he arrived at the experiment lab. They opened the door and chained him down with quirk suppressors as the doctor walked in with a smirk. So, one of you manifested a quirk. Good good. Now I can finally start the good part. Now let's not waste any time and add all six doses at the same time. He walks over to the control panel and starts typing away as the machine whirls to life. As the needles came closer he closed his eyes in relief as he heard the sound of a tiny explosion in the distance. Anarchy did it. He was worried he wouldn't go through with it. Not just because of the fact he would be left behind. This plan came with a lot of risks. They don't know how guarded this lace is. Thank goodness at least they have a chance of getting out. Was his last thought as steering pain enveloped his whole body. Katashi closed his eyes as the guards with Izuku turned the corner. Yeah, better listen to the kid and go to sleep like the useless kids you are. The head guard says as the other three look at him. He tries to even out his breathing. Why didn't Izuku stay silent? He isn't going to blame him for the quirk thing, as he would have probably done the same in his shoes. He opens his eyes and looks at the kids he's come to see as his younger siblings minus Izuku. He knows Izuku would want them to value their own freedom and take this chance to run now. He looks at Kahiro in the eye directly and nods slowly as he whispers to Emya. Do as we practiced. They had practiced using their quirks during both lunch and dinner when there would be no one watching for this. When Amiya nodded, he took a deep breath and shouted, Eyes. They all closed their eyes as Akihiro used his quirk to temporarily blind the guards. Then, Amaya immediately covered the floor in a layer of water. The guards all lose their balance, falling to the ground as they all run for the door. They manifested quirks too. 
He hears one of them shout as he summons a barrier and slams it into the door causing a small explosion. Azami and Akihiro use their quirks to cause a visual disturbance to the guards and Amiya quickly uses her quirk to cause them to lose their balance. He uses his quirk to protect them from both bullets and the quirks of the guards. They run for about five minutes before they get surrounded by a group of villains at an intersection. Sorry, kids, but your journey ends here. Katashi lifts his hands, about to tell the other to run. He was prepared to use his quirk until he dropped. I think the ones whose journey ends here are you. A pink fog fills the hallway as two people jump over the crowd of villains and land right in front of them. His eyes widened in surprise, and he recognized them. They were heroes, but why are they here? He then remembers that Izukasa's quirk went through the ceiling. They must have seen that and came to check it out. Miss Joke turns to them as midnight, and some other hero starts taking out the villains. Hello. Little ones, don't worry we'll get you out of here in a second. She starts taking out the villains using hand-to-hand -hand combat. Watching the three of them fight made him remember something his parents told him. Hey, just because you're quirkless doesn't mean you can't be a hero. Look at heroes like Miss. Joke, Midnight, Gran Torino. And, heck, even All Might uses hand-to-hand -hand combat technically. You don't need a quirk to be able to kick some ass. He wishes he had a phone to record this with because OMG. This would prove literally all of Japan wrong. Only Japan though as other places don't really have the same problem. Before he knew it, he was being picked up by Miss Joke along with Azami. Midnight picked up Akihiro and Namiya. He's glad they all are going to be safe. Wait. They don't know Izuku yet. As the heroes started leaving he shouted. Wait. They stopped and looked at him. They still got Izuku. He's in the testing room. It's down this corridor and past the room with the blown up door. He's in the room at the end of the hall. The man, he thinks they called him Eraser, swore under his breath as ran in the direction they came from. He put his hand to his mouth. Hurry, they're still most likely experimenting on him. Aizawa spirited down the corridor at top speed, experimenting. They were experimenting on these kids. He didn't know why but, he was happy they were close enough to see that red light. He saw a room that had a giant hole where the door should be and turned. He could see a cage in the room as he passed it. If he gritted his teeth any harder they might start to bleed. How did they never hear about kids going missing? It would have been all over the news as worried parents crowded the police station. He didn't like where his train of thought was going. The fact that he didn't know about it meant one of two things. Either their parents never wrote a missing person report, which is bad, or they did, but the police didn't look into it, which was also bad. He didn't get to think about it for much longer as he heard the sound of a child screaming in pain. He somehow made himself move even quicker. He could see the room the screams were coming from. And without even stopping he jumped and kicked the door down. He immediately grabbed the man in a lab coat and commanded him to turn the machine off. He could see that it had six syringes and was injecting them into the little green-haired boy on the table. The fluids in the machines were almost all out. The doctor was taking too long and decided to do it himself. He pushed the big blue button and the machine stopped and lifted itself off the boy who was now whimpering. He slowly walked over and slowly lifted the kid and ran out with the doctor wrapped up in his scarf as he screamed about how his master, all for one wouldn't stand for this, and would come and hunt him down. He only slammed the doctor into the wall to shut him up as the kid who had passed out woke back up. Who? The kid's voice was hoarse, so he pushed him and replied. The name's Eraserhead, kid. The kid tried to nod but winced and let out a whine when he moved his head. Stay still kid, recovery girl is on her way. The kid hummed and fell silent. He finally made it out as the kid from before ran over. Izuku, thank all might that you're safe. I thought they were about to kill you, he exclaimed as he cried. The kid, Izuku, tried to look at him before he stopped trying. Anaki, I would turn to look at you, but I feel like someone slammed a semi-truck into me. So, please wait until I can at the very least move my head. The other boy nodded and walked over to the other kids. Aizawa walked over and laid Izuku down and let the kids crowd him as the one from before glared at the man he had tied up. How long will he serve? Hopefully for life, but he might end up serving like 20 years. The kid nodded with a sigh before rubbing Izuku's head up and down as he walks over to Midnight and Miss Joke. So, what do we know? Midnight asks as soon as he walks over. They were being experimented on and possibly under feed. They are way too skinny. Miss Joke says. They were also being kept in a cage. They turned to him in shock. I saw the room as I was heading to save the green one. 
We were kidnapped from our homes. They locked us in a cage and experimented on us daily. We were only fed twice a day. A small bowl of rice for lunch, and another small bowl of rice with fried fish for dinner. They only gave us one glass of water per day. They allowed us to use the restrooms at specific times they gave us. Mocked and insulted daily with the occasional hit with poles. All five kids said it appeared they heard them despite them being a good couple of feet away and whispering. The experiments caused us to develop heightened senses, Izuku explained from where he was laying down. The kids then go back to comforting each other as a familiar white car drives up. Aizawa, you owe me for this one. I'm on vacation. Chio says as she leaves the car. Now why am I here? You three knuckleheads look fine to me. She asks as she waves her cane at them. Aizawa wordlessly points at the five kids who are looking at her in confusion. Oh my, what cute kids you are. She says as she walks over to them. They look at her suspiciously, but when she walks in view of Izuku he shouts. Oh my is that recovery girl? Chiyo looks surprised for a second before smiling. What a smart little boy. You must know your heroes. He nods before groaning as a few tears fall. Izuku, don't move your head yet you dolt. The boy with white hair shouted. Sorry. Chiyo chuckles before walking closer. I assume your name is Izuku. The kid smiles. Yes, I'm Izuku Yagi. Yagi, Yagi, where has he heard that name from? He knows he's heard it somewhere, but where? Though it seemed Chiyo knew the name too as she froze for a second. Then why hasn't sorry? Do you think you have enough energy for me to heal you? Izuku freezes and stares off into space for a moment. Yes. All you need to do is heal me enough that I can walk or move my head. She nods and kisses him on the forehead before handing him a few of her gummies. Eat three of these. Now, what's your name? She turns to the girl with red hair. Azami Tatsuki. The girl says as Chiyo heals her. Though his attention was now focused on Izuku who was now sitting up with help from the other two boys. He looked around. Oh, I know where we are. He exclaims after taking in their surroundings. You do? He asks, walking closer. Yes, I live nearby. Actually we're very close to where I got taken. He says as he trails off at the end. So, he was taken somewhere in this area. He thinks about what he knows is nearby besides houses. Were you taken while playing at my Fisto Park? Izuku nods. I live within walking distance of the house. Can I go home now? He asked with a tilt of his head. They will need your statement, but yes. After the cops arrive. He says as Izuku nods. Izuku waved goodbye to his friends and promised to one day see each other again in the future. They were on their way to the police station so their parents could pick them up. He doesn't have to go as he lives nearby. Eraserhead picks him up and asks for directions to his home. He gladly points the way. He misses his mom and wants one of her hugs now. They never fail to make him feel good. Recovery Girl's quirk did erase most of the pain, but not everything as he was too fatigued. So, he's in a lot of pain right now. He came back to reality as he saw a similar house. There, Mr. Eraserhead. He shouts as he points at his house. Eraserhead places him on the porch. Thank you. You don't have to stay here. He says before using one of the spare keys to open the door. He saw from the window that Eraserhead didn't leave until after he closed the door. Izuku walked around the dark house until he found the light switch wondering why the house was so quiet. He couldn't hear the sound of breathing so, he assumed they weren't home. He wandered into the kitchen, where he saw a plate of croissants and a note. It was addressed to him. Dear Izuku, I hope you come out of your room and read this. But, if you do leave your room, I just wanted to let you know we're at the hospital as Izumi caught a really bad cold. Well, I'll be back tomorrow. Love you from mom. Also P. S. How about we go to that new All Might cafe that opened near your school? They didn't notice. A year later, come on. Midnight and Miss Joke have merch. How about Stereo Crash? Dang, I might need to create a poster for him too. He grumbled angrily before he sighed. He leaned back against his chair as he looked around his room. His room was no longer covered in All Might merch because can now. The room he shared with his sister was covered in them because she still basically worships the ground he walks on. He replaced his All Might merch with a normal purple blanket and posters of several underground and limelight heroes. There are three figurines, a plushie, and five posters. There's lots of merch of Green Empress sprinkled all over the place, some of them limited edition and very rare, though those surprisingly aren't his most prized possession. He turns to look at his bed, an eraser head plushie, and a poster hanging over his bed. 
He made them himself when he realized that Eraserhead has no merch as he's good at making sure the public doesn't know about him. Though unlikely for him, there are forum pages where people saved by him all talk about their experiences. He's a real hero, saved about a thousand lives with no credit, because he's not a limelight hero. Better than that muscle head. It's been a year since the day he was rescued by Eraserhead. He's now seven and has his own room, thank goodness. He doesn't know what he would have done if he had to share his room with Izumi until they hit puberty or one of them presented. He closed his eyes. Things at home haven't really changed much, but, at the same time, things have changed a lot since then. For one he and his mother are much closer, and the tiny rift that formed between them when last year has been repaired and is better than ever. Mom is busy with her hero work, but still tries to make time for him and Izumi, but mainly him. Every three weeks she tries to dedicate one day to him, and they go out and have fun without his father and sister. It's a nice bonding time for them. He guesses Ekihiro wasn't wrong about his mother still loving him. And, yes, he said hero work. He knew his mother was Green Empress and let her know about it about eight months ago. She didn't seem surprised by this fact and only asked how. He explained how when writing his page on Green Empress, he realized their quirks are extremely similar which then led him to realize they had the same hair and eye color, something he didn't pay attention to before. He knew that green hair and green eyes are fairly common, but to have both at the same time is basically unheard of outside of his family. After he realized that fact it didn't take long to connect the dots. His mom confirmed his suspicions then, and made him wonder how his father managed to score someone as cool as his mom. Then seven months ago the reveal came, his idiot of a father is All Might, who is also a blonde idiot. He would say that the stereotype of blondes being idiots was true, if he didn't know the Bakugos. That revelation immediately killed all the love he had for the hero, and made being in his old room uncomfortable. Not that it's ever been comfortable since he was five, much less now after the kidnapping thing. The amount of times he's had a panic attack when Izumi and her friends throw open the door is astounding and very sad. So, he begged his mom to give him a new room, and she did though he hasn't finished moving his things into it yet. She had no problem because they had the room for it. Their house was three stories after all, so there were a lot of rooms that have left empty. He was actually given three of the four rooms on the third floor to do whatever he wanted by his mom, but didn't know what to do with the third one. He uses his second room as a room where makes and stores the posters he makes. Speaking of that room, he should be getting there now. He's got a science fair to prepare for. He saves his progress on his laptop before leaving his room and walking down the hall to the artistic room, as his mom calls it. As he walks into the room, he thinks about the rules their teacher set. 1. You can have up to two partners, but everyone has to put in a log telling what part you did. 2. You have to make something or prove something. 3. Try to be creative, please. He closed his eyes as he sat down. What could he do? He doesn't want to do the simplest thing like a volcano because he's expecting the majority of the students to do that already. The reason he wants to do a good job is that he hopes to make at least third place or the top five. This is the first time something is going to be graded based on what you turned in and not on whether or not you have a quirk. So, he wants to score high without teachers bringing his score down because he's quirkless or accusing him of cheating when they know damn well he didn't. He opened his eyes and groaned. Why does this have to be so hard? He shouted slamming his head on the table. He was about to start complaining again when he opened his eyes. There on the other end of the table was his mom's old laptop that stopped working. She let him keep it to do whatever he wanted with it when she went and bought a new one. The advancement of science and technology stopped after the first quirks appeared. Maybe he could do some upgrades to his electronics. The only advanced technology is the advanced ways of communication that are only given to heroes while on missions. Meanwhile, the public doesn't have access to things like that. He stared at it before jumping up excitedly. He suddenly got an idea. He smirks to himself before running back to his bedroom, and after going through his book bag he found it. The thing he's been hiding from everyone besides mom. His credit card with his allowance on there. His mom gave it to him, as he kept losing the money, whenever she gave him physical bills and coins. It gets added to every month, on holidays, or when he does something good. So, basically. There's a lot of money on here. He quickly puts on a blue t-shirt and black pants and heads to the door. He puts his card in his pocket, as he decides to also buy himself some type of wallet or purse to keep it in. He puts his sneakers on and turns his watch on. Mom got him this as she began to fear how often he's left alone or goes outside by himself, worried he might get kidnapped. 
Ironic am I right? She told him to turn it on whenever he leaves the house. It's solar powered and can last 48 hours when charged to the max. He didn't have the heart to tell her that her fears were already realized when it was so clear to him that she already feels guilty for neglecting him for a whole year. That's most likely why she gives him whatever he wants or just buys him things on a whim. After making sure it's on, he leaves the house with a quick text to his mother saying he's going to the mall. She tells him to stay safe and that she'll be home in an hour. He took a deep breath feeling the cool air fill his lungs before he starts walking the mall. He walked at a slow but brisk pace. The science fair isn't until next month, but he's going to need a lot of time for what he has planned. When he arrives the first thing he does is immediately go to one of the clothing stores. They usually have purses and wallets in the women's section. After buying both a crossbag and a wallet, he walks to the electronics store. He walked around looking at all the laptops, before buying five of the latest models. Then on a whim, he buys five watches and phones. He then realizes he's going to have to carry these back home. He leaves and goes to the children's store and buys a wagon before heading back to the electronics store and piling his purchases onto the wagon and leaving. The workers are nice, and he's known most of them since he was young, so they were very worriedly after they realized he was walking alone. After all, he's basically asking to get robbed or kidnapped. He reassured them that he was going to be fine. No, they don't need to call his parents before he left the shop. As he walked to the exit, he wondered how much more free time he was going to have. His father is off doing hero work and Izumi is most likely either asleep or with one of the sets of twins. About an hour of free time, he supposes as he looks at the time, 8 am. When he gets outside he sees a person selling cookbooks. He likes cooking with his mom. And though he doesn't heed to cook for himself anymore, he found that he rather enjoys it as a fun hobby. He walks over and sees he's giving away three different types, and he has a bundle set as well. He just decided to buy the whole bundle, and ended up getting an extra book for free. The first book was on Japanese cuisine the second on European desserts, the third on Italian cuisine, and the fourth was on various types of desserts around the world. After skimming through it, he saw it has a whole section dedicated to European desserts, and it made the same stuff as the book just with more desserts. He decided to give the one on European desserts to his mom. She would love it as she wanted to learn more about the treats she could make, and he wants to keep the other three, as he wants to learn how to cook to surprise his mom one day. When he does, He'll cook a full course meal full of all her favorite treats. He walks home and manages to get the wagon up the stairs to the third floor. That was a little more challenging than he expected. Maybe he should have not tried dragging a full wagon up to staircases. Or maybe he just needs to work out. The third floor has only four large rooms up here. The last one is a small study for him and his mom. The other two members of the household aren't big literature fans. So, Father and Izumi will pretty much have no business being up here unless they were looking for him once he moved into his new room. He plans to finish moving in once the science fair is over. He wonders if mom did that on purpose. Some more tiny foods for thought. He thinks to himself as he walks into his art room and locks the door. He sits the wagon in the corner and gets to work. He has a long month ahead of him. Okay, he knows he may have gone a little overboard, but this has to be perfect. He's not a perfectionist, like some people accused him of being. He yawned as he walks to school with Izumi. He's carrying his project in the purple and black bag on his back. His hair was pulled up into a tiny little ponytail by a yellow hair band. His hair is growing. Should he cut it? He yawned again. OMG, stop yawning you stupid loser. Why did you not get any sleep last night? Izumi shouted looking at him in annoyance. Well, sorry, I was up early and couldn't get as much sleep as you. What does it have to do with you anyway? One other thing that occurred over the year was that he's trying to follow Azami's advice. Though it still somewhat confuses him. Maybe he should as Miss Nevermind. Wow well, well, all your stupid yawning is distracting me. Izumi stammered, a little put off by his comeback. Yeah, and he started sticking up for himself, not too much. Just making a few comments here and there. I see. He looks back down at his phone. It's still his original one. He was watching an interview with Midnight. It made him laugh seeing the way she was making the interviewer blush without even using her quirk. Heck, it looks like all she's doing is just sitting there talking. Laughed again, watching the way the interviewer was stuttering over his words. Hey, what are you watching? He sighed and rolled his eyes. An interview. Izumi peered closer. Is that midnight? Yes. He answered without looking up. 
Why are you watching her? Because I like Midnight. You, you can't like her. She's inappropriate. You shouldn't even be watching her. He stopped and looked at her confused. Why was she so flustered? HHM? Why? No, you're... She's, uh, just... Ugh. I'm going ahead. She stomps ahead of him frustrated as he looks on in confusion. What was that about? He didn't see the issue with Midnight. She was an excellent hero, and one of the ones that helped save him and his friends. He still doesn't know what happened to them. The police only told him they were returned to their families. Which made him relieved. He shrugged his shoulders and continued walking behind her. Her weird behavior was known of his business. Besides, today's his free day from them. They can't bully him with other schools around. He yawned and stretched his arms out. The reason he was up early to make his lunch. He made two because he knows that the first will get destroyed or eaten by Izumi and her friends or one of the other bullies at school. Though the other bullies don't really bully him anymore unless they're with Izumi and her friends. He had been using the books to practice his cooking and can confidently say, while he's not bad at cooking, he's way better at baking. Still not on the level to make that full course meal, but he's getting there. They made it to their school and Izumi immediately ran over to her friends as he tried to hurry past them. The other schools aren't here yet, and he didn't want to be attacked while he was carrying his month-long project with him. This thing was more valuable to him than his life at the moment. Hey, nerd. You lucked out today as we can't do anything before the fair, but once that stupid thing is over we will make up for lost time. Kak Katsuki shouted as Izuku tried to speed walk into the school. Izumi likely didn't know this, but he did and it makes sense to him. Their school wasn't the best at really anything, in all honesty. It was a shitty school. But when it has important people or adults around it tries to pretend to be a decent school so, no bullying is allowed. They don't care if you're their special donkey, a future cash or fame opportunity, like Izumi and her friends. If you do something that ruins their reputation, then you might as well be dead to them. Hence, his shitty treatment, because having quirkless student apparently lowered their ratings to others. But that's a shit excuse because it's not like they go around writing, there's a quirkless kid here on the walls. If anything the way the school allows bullying to take place is what turns people off. Seriously, if you let a student set a girl on fire because she had a useless quirk, parents aren't going to want their child there. And that bastard never faced legal repercussions for that incident. He shook his head as he walked into his homeroom class and sat in the back seat he shares with Shoko. No one's outside, so he is alone. He takes the opportunity to take a nap as classes don't start until 9 and it's currently 8. He'll get a good hour or so of sleep before it starts. Guess that's one thing he should thank that doctor for besides the quirk he's too scared to use. The fact he still treats every precious minute of sleep like it's something special, and not something everybody takes for granted. He hates sleeping when Izumi's friends are over, especially the Bakugo twins. When they barge into his room and start yelling, it always causes him to fly into a silent panic attack. He starts having flashbacks, and sometimes it causes him to believe that he's back in that cage. It's a miracle no one found out what happened as he's had panic attacks in front of them before. He does visit the Todoroki kids a lot especially Taoya, as he looks like a Kihiro a bit, and his eyes remind him of Azami. He thinks of these things while he's taking his nap. He thinks of the friends he made, but hasn't been able to reunite with yet. He tried looking them up, but couldn't find anything. He hears the sound of the door opening, so one other thing occurred due to the time when he was kidnapped. He can hear the things around him despite him being asleep. This caused him to become a light sleeper, as every little sound causes him to wake up. He hears the person walk into the room. Based on their breathing and footsteps, he assumes it's Shoko. His theory was then proven correct when he felt someone sit down beside him. HHMP, why can't your sister be as smart as you? She whispers, oh god what did she do this time? Though he did notice he did notice she called him smart. Like this plan is so stupid that you can't think of a dumber one. Oh wow. That description alone sounds like a plan his sister would make. What plan is she referring to? I don't understand why Katsuki isn't telling her this plan is stupid and won't lead to anything good. Good question. He never hesitates to say that Izumi is stupid any other time so, why not now? Not that he knows what kind of god-tier level stupidity. This plan must be if Shoko's calling it stupid. The door opens again, and the sound of several groups of kids talking feel the room. His head began to hurt from all the noise as the bell rings. Should he get some noise cancelers? Like ones given to some people with mutant quirks. 
He decides now is a good time to wake up and opens his eyes and stretches. Yes, while he may have heard everything Shoko was saying, he was truly asleep and not pretending. Good morning, Deku. Did you have a good nap, Deku? One of the many nicknames they gave him after they started bullying him. It means useless, but he thinks they're just stupid as the only reason they gave him that name was because the Bakugo twins misread his name. I did, Shoko. He said as he straightened himself as the teacher walked in. Good morning class. Now I'm not going to hold you for long. I'm just going to call the roll and give you the rules for today. All right? The class screamed out their agreement as he stayed silent. Their teacher called the roll and once she finished she immediately began the short explanation. Okay, class. Now running or horse playing during the fair. All students must remain in the gym. You must be at your station when the judges go around the fair. No teasing, picking on, or making fun of others. She looked directly at the Bakugu twins when she said that. No sabotaging or going near anyone else's project until the judges have already been at their table. And finally, have fun and stay behaved. Now go. The class ran out until it was only him and Shoko left. Good luck, Izuku. She says with a smile as she stands up. Yeah, you too. I know you got stuck with Izumi as your partner. He said before he left the classroom and made his way to the gym. He could see a lot of buses all lined up outside the school gates and assumed the students were already inside as the buses were empty. He walked in and went to his designated booth. It was just a plain white table. He could see other students already had projects on their booths. He didn't give his project to the school even though they work hard to keep their image up. It would only be during the festival. If he turned his project in before today, they would have somehow lost it. He didn't want that to happen so. He brought it himself as students are allowed to do that. He places down his book bag and starts setting up his table. He assumed they weren't going to offer him any tablecloths or anything like that. So he had brought his own things with him. He reached into his book bag and pulled out a black tablecloth. He then took a tri-board out of his book bag. This book bag was something he got as a gift from his mom. The inside is deeper than it appears on the outside. He placed the tri-board on one side of the table and took out the laptop, phone, watch, and his tablet he ended up upgrading as well. He set the laptop, watch, and phone on the table and turned on his tablet. He didn't bring the tablet as a product, but for him to use to make sure everything is in order. Not to mention this was his personal tablet too. The upgrades he added to the devices were a faster connection, easier to carry, and the ability to sync with each other. The screens have an interactive holographic feature, which he added when he used the tablet to design a poster for Stereo Crash. He turned on the connective feature causing the other electronics to turn on. He can see and control what's on the screens on his laptop. He wanted to check to make sure everything was in order. He taped on the watch, and the screen displayed a motion of a bird flying over a forest, and then would change to Green Empress flying through the city. He then looked down at his watch, he upgraded due to being bored. If it wasn't obvious enough that he doesn't trust his school, he added a special feature to the devices that he hasn't mentioned yet. Every electronic he upgraded has a tracker in them. You can see their location on the watch. He tapped his watch screen, and it displayed an image similar to that of a radar. He saw three dots, a giant red dot, a small purple dot, and a small red dot. He tapped each dot, and it confirmed that they told him the address of both his home and the school. If he zoomed into it, then he should have a holographic image of the building with the exact location of each electronic. He didn't do that as he saw someone walking in the direction of his table. He closed the hologram on his watch and looked up at them before frowning when he saw who it was. You can't be here as the judges haven't come to my table yet, Shoto. Shoto shrugged and looked at his products. What is this? He turns to read the tri-board as Izuku looks back down at his tablet. He decided to hack into the cameras. He opened the cameras and looked around in boredom. He sighed internally at the number of soda volcanoes here. Though he did catch sight of something interesting. There was a boy with purple hair, and he actually made something for his project. It looked like some type of mask, so he immediately became interested in this boy's project. He looked around the kid's general area to estimate where he was. He's not too far from where Izumi and Shoko are. After the judges visit him, he'll go and check out his project. He looked back up at Shoto when he left out a fake cough. Yes? What are you doing? Looking around, making plans, he said as Shoto only blinked before leaving with one last sentence. Oh, Taoya said he's coming to see what project you're going to show off. 
Izuku watches him leave before he decides to turn on the laptop and phone. The laptop was now displaying a video of Miss Joke. The phone did a holographic display of the U. A. Sports Festival. He watched the phone fascinated. Even though he made this, he can't help but be amazed by it sometimes. Looked up when he heard the sound of heels clinking against the ground. He sees a woman with black hair and purple eyes. Hello, what's your name? He tilted his head as he looked at her. Something about her was familiar. Izuku Yagi. Something in her eye sparkled and she smiled. Haru Masajiro. She turned and viewed the tri-board. As something in his head told him her name was important. But he couldn't put his finger on it. And he didn't have the time to think about it at the moment. Ah, oh, so this is an upgraded laptop, phone, and watch. Tell me more about the upgrade. Okay, so, starting with the watch. It can connect to the internet and works as fast as the laptop and phone. It can track your heart rate and bodily condition, make calls and emails, and has a holographic screen. She looked surprised. And you did this yourself, he nodded. Yes, it took a lot of trial and error. Okay, I assume the phone has similar upgrades. Yes, the phone and laptop have pretty much the same upgrades. She glanced back at the tri-board. It says something about artificial intelligence. He blinked before burying his head in his hands. I forgot. About them. He looked back at the tablet and went to the settings and saw both Emily and Felix were turned off. He quickly turns it on. Sorry, guys I forgot I never turned you on these devices. It's fine. Next time I will just send a notification to your watch. Emily and Felix said from the watch and tablet. He had ended up accidentally creating them during his second trial run with the laptop. After realizing what he made he ran to the bookstore and got ten books on coding and managed to make them fully intelligent and sentient. Their names didn't have a specific meaning like how it normally works when one names an AI. He did make Emily's name start with an E for emotional support, as that is the role he programmed her for. Felix does maintenance and makes sure things are in order while fulfilling orders. So, we have two eyes. The one talking from the watch is Emily. Her name isn't an abbreviation. But, I did choose her name because it starts with an E for emotion support. Emotional support is her primary function, so she is on both the watch and phone. Though she does also track the physical condition of whoever has the phone or watch. Miss Masajiro lets out an impressed hum. And the other one. That's Felix, though his name is the same as Emily's. It has no special meaning, and I just like the name. He helps with maintenance and makes sure there are no bugs or viruses. So, he's on all of the electronics. She nodded. And the tablet you're holding? Izuku blinked in surprise. Oh, this is something for me to make sure all the functions are in order while controlling what's on the screen. Miss Masajiro nodded. So, it says the holograms are interactive. Is that true? Izuku nodded and turned the hologram on. It showed a flat plane as he leaned over and grabbed a speck. He lifted his hand and a column appeared on the hologram. He then swiped his finger across and the top half of the column crumbled. Miss Masajiro let out a gasp and leaned closer. So it moves in real time and is interactive. She tries it and makes a vase. It's like I'm making this in a pottery class. He nodded and smiled. I didn't originally plan to add this feature, but I decided to add it after I used it on the tablet to draw an image. She nodded and pulled out a clipboard and started writing something. Okay, the judges should be here in five minutes. She smiled as he tilted his head in confusion. Oh, so I guess you can say I'm a primarily round judge, since there are a lot of kids here who had done basic projects, or just plain stupid things. They gave people like me to check the projects for each school, to decide who actually put effort into their project before the judges arrive. She reaches into her bag and pulled out a blue marker, and drew a raven in the corner of his tri-board. So, they will be checking your school first so, you won't have to wait long. He agrees and Miss Masajiro leaves. He closes his eyes and then looks at the clock on his watch. Now the real science fair start. Three hours later Izuku was drained as Emily gave him silent encouragement from his watch. Great job. How about you sit down and have a water break? He silently agreed. A water break sounded nice right about now. But he has no way of knowing whether the judges came or not as they appeared to blend in with the crowd. They might have done that on purpose to see how the students are acting when they think the judges aren't there to supervise them. He sighed and opened his book bag and reached his arm all the way in and felt around. He had thought about this beforehand and brought a couple of bottles of water. He let out a quiet, aha, uh -huh, when he found it. He pulled it out as the speakers came to life. 
He jumped at the loud whistle noise. It let out as he held his ears dropping his water bottle. Luckily he hadn't opened it yet. Took a few deep breaths before lowering his hands. That sound reminded him of something that made a similar noise. Something enviable made him think of the doctor. He heard that the man was supposed to serve ten years, but was jumped by several of the other prisoners. Good for him, I guess. He shook his head as a woman's voice came through the speakers. The judges have been to all of the tables. The judges have been to all the tables. Students are allowed to walk around, but must be back at their stations in ten minutes for the announcement of the winners. He could see some kids look around confused or start complaining. He shrugged and smiled as he realized that he could check out the purple-haired boy's table. He grabbed his tablet and said, Felix, switch to guard mode. Felix confirmed that he enabled guard mode and will let him know when he should come back. He tucked his tablet under his arm and headed in the direction he knew the boy was in. After two minutes of walking, he found the table and saw the boy sitting there on his phone. He looked to be reading something with a bored expression. Hey, I saw you on the camera and wanted to see what you made. The boy looked up at him surprised before he frowned and narrowed his eyes. He could tell he was suspicious. Does he get bullied too, or teased a lot? Okay, who sent you? He sounded as tired as the amount of bangs under his eyes conveyed. Izuku blinked in confusion. Me? He narrowed his eyes to the point he looked like he was glaring at him. Then why are you really here? Because I saw the mask on the camera and became interested in what you made. The boy didn't appear to believe him so, he asked Felix to hack the cameras again. He then turned the tablet screen toward the boy, and then pointed in the direction of the nearest camera. The boy blinked in surprise and looked between the tablet and the camera. He then sighed before standing up straight. Fine, so you said you came over here to see my project. Izuku smiled genuinely, something he's only done around a few people recently. Izuku Yagi here from Aldera Elementary School. The boy huffed before replying. Hitoshi Shinso from Nabu Elementary School. His smile brightened. Damn, I wish I had shades. Shinso said under his breath before pushing the mask in his direction. Now that it was in front of him, he could see that the mask had a very complicated design. He looked at the tri board on Shinso's table. It said that it was a voice changer mask. Uo, that sounds cool. Why did you decide to make it? He exclaimed excitedly as he whipped his head around to Shinso, who jumped slightly. Um, because of my quirk. Izuku's eyes sparkled. Wow, what's your quirk? Must be something voice-related. Shinso looked uncomfortable when he realized he backed down. He didn't want to make Shinso uncomfortable. You don't have to tell me if you don't to. Shinso looked at him surprised. Wa, Izuku, you have three minutes left. Please come back. Felix's voice ran out through the tablet startling them both. Okay, coming back now. Hope to see you again Shinso. He turned around and walked back to his booth. He saw a boy crying in front of the booth while holding his hand was blistering. Are you the one in charge of this booth? One of the teachers shouted at him. Yes, I am. You should be disqualified for the fact that you made this project to injure our star students. Izuku blankly stared at the boy. He could feel the gazes of everyone looking at them. He took a deep breath before firing back. I apologize for the fact that your star student was injured, Miss Hyro. She smiles in victory. HHMP. I don't even believe a quirkless kid like you could have made something this advanced. Who did you steal this from? He glared at her. I made that myself over the month. No one has ever made something like this. You can go look it up and check. Miss Hyro looked surprised that he was talking back to her. Her face started to turn a little red. Whether that was from anger or embarrassment didn't matter to him. She wanted to embarrass and humiliate him in front of a crowd. Then she can get humiliated in front of all of her students. And by the quirkless brat next door too. Yeah he's heard everything they say about him, they think he isn't looking. And not to mention, the only reason your star student would have gotten injured is if he touched one of the electronics without permission. Miss. Hyro opened her mouth to respond. But he didn't give her a chance. He knew all she was going to do was shout bullshit anyway. Don't try to deny it as this gym is full of working cameras and there are five of them within range of my booth that would gladly prove that he touched it without permission. She gritted her teeth as she glared at him while the kid was still there crying over his burned hand. Oh, and Miss Hyro, he walked behind his booth and smirked at her. Just because you don't have the amount of intelligence necessary to make something half as advanced as this with your quirk that allows you to change your skin color than me who wasn't born with a quirk, that doesn't mean that I can't make something of this caliber. 
Miss Hyro turned red in anger and was about to hit him when someone grabbed her wrist. Mocking, insulting, an attempted assault against a child. While also ignoring your student who's crying in pain after attempting to make him intentionally attempt to sabotage another student's project. They turned to see a woman in a sharp suit with dark blue hair and red eyes. She glared at Miss Hyro. That's grounds to get your teaching license suspended. The woman looked around at the principal of Aldera Elementary. I hope that your school will take the proper disciplinary actions. As the last two are very serious offenses. The principal starts sweating as he most likely wasn't going to punish her originally and would have punished him instead. Well, uh, she's not going to receive punishment because of the student's quirkless status. No, uh, we're going to discuss this. No need, she's going to have to be retrained. I'll let the board know. She pulled out a phone and sent the principal and Miss Hyro away as she called an ambulance for the kid. A minute after that they called the students to the stage for the announcement of the winners. He walked down after putting his electronics back into his book bag. He wasn't going to have a repeat of what happened before taking the whole book bag with him. He ended up standing near Izumi, Shoko, and Shinso who he waved at with a slight smile. Okay, thank you everyone for participating in this year's science fair. Now, most of you did a good job and came up with an interesting and original project to show off today. So, the judges went around and viewed all the booths that had a blue marking on the corner of their tri-board. A man with black hair and red eyes exclaimed as the crowd of students started cheering. Now, so in third place, we have. He opened the brown envelope and pulled out a card. Aoi Roku. A girl walked up. She had blue hair and pink eyes. He could see that she had a red hair band tied around her hair and had freckles just like him. She was given a trophy and stood on the stage. The man takes out a gray envelope. In second place we have Hitoshi Shinso. He turned to Shinso with a smile as he looked around in surprise for a minute. They called you, go take your trophy. He blushed before making his way to the stage. He grabbed his silver trophy and awkwardly stood beside Roku. The man grabbed a yellow envelope. And in first place we have Izuku Yagi. He blinked several times as he slowly processed that he won first place. The place exploded in cheers, making his heart rate pick up rapidly. He started breathing fast as Shoko pushed him in the direction of the stage. He slowly made his wake up the stairs and took the gold trophy. The reason the kids were cheering was that the number of kids who didn't know him outnumbered the number of students who attended Aldera. Then Izuku stood by Shinso still breathing heavily. Shinso looked at him confused. Why was Yagi breathing so heavily? His eyes were looking around the place as he became paler and paler. His eyes weren't truly focused, he realized. The sparkle in his eyes wasn't there anymore. So, he had the feeling that he should tell the adults what was going on. But, he heard the commotion from earlier. He was worried that the adults won't take them seriously so. He did the first thing that came to mind. Use his quirk. Izuku, are you okay? Um, yes. Im, Izuku's eyes turned white, and he went still. Breath slowly. Izuku's breathing started to even out, and a minute later, he dropped his quirk. Was that your quirk? Shinso jumped at the monotone voice he uses before giving a quiet yes. Okay. Thank you Shinso. That was really heroic. He then put a rather convincing fake smile on his face, as the students were dismissed. If he hadn't seen him smile earlier, he would have fallen for it too. But that wasn't the thing he really focused on at the moment. That was not only the first time someone thanked him for using his quirk but also the first time someone called him heroic. Izuku felt calm despite the fact Emily did not seem to agree with that fact. If the millions of texts he received in the last five minutes, he checked his watch and calmly whispered, Emily, please wait until I'm in the car to blast me with texts or call my mom. He later regretted that statement as it appeared Emily took his advice. Why did he give her access to his mom's phone again? The man at the mic turned and faced them hey. Could you three return here with your parents in a few minutes? They all nodded and walked off. He didn't need to ask for one of them to text his mother as Felix did at the moment the man asked them if they can get his parents there. His mother responded in a few seconds and said she was by Izumi's booth with dad. He said he was coming over, but the judges wanted to tell them something. She sent a thumbs up and he picked up the pace. He could see Izumi sulking there with all her friends as their father rubbed her back. Hey, my little winner. Mom said when she saw him as she walked over with a smile. She then leaned closer and whispered. You will be seeing your therapist about this. He nodded and decided it was fair. Despite the fact, he managed to hide that he was kidnapped for about a year.
he couldn't really hide the unfortunate side effects of all that trauma. His mom didn't know why he was suffering from PTSD, and among other things, but she still signed him up with a good unbiased therapist. Mom, the judges want to talk to my parents, though I'm sure only one is necessary. This is his way of saying he didn't want dad there. Mom nodded. Tashinori, I'm going with Izuku to talk to the judges. He looked up from where he was comforting Izumi. I can go too. Just give me a minute. Mom sighed. No, they have to leave in five minutes. Father only leaned over and picked up Izumi before walking towards the stage. He looked at Mom, who looked done, for a second before sighing. I guess father's coming too. They walk back to the stage where Roku was there with both of her parents with Shinso, who only had one parent. A blonde man with his hair in a bun. Okay, everyone's here. A woman with shoulder-length brown hair and yellow eyes. I'm one of the judges, you know Daoi. She had a nice smile, he likes her already. So, this year the judges are all from either Saomei Elementary, Saomei Junior High, or Saomei University. And we all decided that we would offer the top three winners a paid scholarship to attend Saomei Elementary and Saomei Junior High. Izuku looked at his mom with sparkling eyes. Saomei is a high-end school that is mainly for the rich. Honestly, his family could afford to have both him and Izumi attend all the way to the university level. His mom saw the look on his face and smiled with a small nod. Sure, this is a good opportunity for Aoi. Roku's mother said as she smiled at her daughter. Saomei isn't that far from where we live so, I don't think Sho would have any complaints. After all, Hitoshi did rightfully earn it. The blonde man said while ruffling Shinzo's hair. They all turned to his parents who answered at the same time. No. Yes. Mom glared at father before turning to Miss Daoi. Yes, I would like for him to attend. He would benefit from that environment compared to where he is now. Miss Daoi didn't seem to know what to do so. She only said, They will all start next week. And over the weekend a staff member will stop and drop off their uniforms. His mom and the other parents agreed while ignoring his father's protests. After Miss Daoi and the other parents left he gave mom a look. Sending him to Saomei would be unfair to Izumi. How? She's just at home at Aldera, unlike Izuku. I don't feel like he's being challenged enough at that school. And Izumi is. Yes, she's not as intelligent as Izuku. But won't she be lonely without her brother being at the school with her? What? Lonely? She'll probably be mad that she can't beat me up anymore. He huffed internally. Father is spitting some mad bullshit today. Maybe it was because Izumi didn't win. He mentioned how he went bragging to all his friends that Izumi was going to win first place. She has both the Bakugo and Todoroki twins with her. Well, won't Izuku be lonely without his sister? I don't know, will you? Inko asked, trying to make sure he actually wanted to go. No, I'll be fine, I really want to go. His father took a deep breath, annoyed as he realized that his chance of winning this is low. This isn't over. His father then stomped off, and he immediately jumped on his mother excitedly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He's no longer going to Aldera. He feels like a brand new door opened for him, and it's glowing bright like the first baby that was born with a quirk. He smiled as he started to think about what his new school would be like. You're still going to your therapist after I take your sister and father home. Damn, he thought he got out of that. Hey, 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 get up. Izuku, it's your first day at your new school. Cooking like a chef. I'm a five-star Michelin. Izuku jumped up. I'm up. I'm up. Please don't I can't start jamming. Okay? He may have lied about why he chose the name, Felix. He came across a pre-quirk outbreak K-pop group. Their songs are really catchy, and he might have named one of his eyes as an homage to that group. He leaped out of bed as he heard the sound of laughing from Emily and Felix. Come on guys, you can't do that. He whined as he gave his computer a fake glare. Both of their eyes are on this computer so, he was looking at both. How else were we supposed to wake you up in time for school? Felix asked while still laughing. He huffed as he walked into his closet and pulled out his new uniform. It was a white shirt, black tie, navy blue sweater vest, and black trousers. The crest of the school was on the sweater vest. He felt the tears coming on as Emily shouts. Don't cry, yet. Wait until you arrive at the school. Speaking of Saomei Elementary, do you know the route you're going to take there? Felix asked as he nodded to his question. He pulled up the trousers. Yes, I went and memorized the route I wanted to take. He slowly looked in the direction of his computer. But, if you want to you can record it down. 
I'm taking Route G. He puts on his socks and grabs his sweater vest. You too, switch to the watch before I go to the kitchen for breakfast with mom. He says breakfast, but it's more like his mom cooks something for both of them as they both have some place to be this morning. And he's going to be making his lunch while she makes breakfast. Izumi and their father aren't going to be there as she doesn't get up for another hour, while father was forced to take the day off. He slips on the vest and looks in the mirror. It's higher quality compared to the Aldera uniform. Clearly showing off the difference in money, the schools have. He thinks he looks rather sharp in this outfit, like uncle when he goes somewhere. He nods pleased with himself, puts on his watch, and grabs his school bag before leaving his room. Are you here yet? He asks as he runs to the kitchen, being careful not to face Blint down the stairs. He fell five times already since he moved onto the third floor. She? Yes, we're both here. He did give them some updates since the science fair. For example, making it possible for them to be on two devices at the same time, and on the same device at the same time. He also added Emily to his laptop and his mother's phone, at his mom's request of course. Otherwise, Emily would be nowhere near her phone. Good morning, mommy, he says making sure to control his volume despite the fact Izumi and father sleep like a log. Great. Another thing they have in common. Good morning, Izu. I'm almost done with breakfast. I'm making the Tamagoya now. He nods and puts on his apron that he got for his seventh birthday. He started making himself a bento for lunch as he let his mind wander. The science fair occurred right before winter break, so they will start in the third semester. It does feel odd when he realizes that he will be joining in the middle of the school year. He realizes the rice was already made for him, so he thanks his mom before making six rabbit-shaped onagiris. Was he considering insulting professional bento makers by doing it wrong? Yes. He was going to add amaris and taco sausages to his bento, with some cut veggies so Emily and his mom don't bother him about eating healthy. He blinked when he was finally done as he realized he made two bentos. He shrugged his shoulders and decided to take both before putting them in his rando's roux and going to the table to eat his breakfast. Do you have all your school supplies? Yes, mom. Do you know the route to take to school? Yes, mom. I even had Felix memorize it in case I forgot. She nodded before asking her final question. Are you sure that you can go alone? He hesitated at that one. In all honesty, he doesn't. But he doesn't want to burden his mother. One should instead use her time to help other people. Plus, unlike the time when he was kidnapped, which she still doesn't know about, he went to great lengths to ensure that only she wouldn't know. But, back to what he was saying previously, unlike the time when he was kidnapped, he has Felix and Emily. So, he's technically not alone. Yes, I'm sure. If anything happened Emily would be able to quickly call you. He says with a smile before slipping on his shoes. Since she's going in the opposite direction, she can't come with him to Saume Elementary and she worries about him going to places by himself, even when she seems cool with it. Don't worry, we'll make sure he gets there on time safely. And if it makes you feel better I could update you and tell you when he gets there. His mom smiles and agrees before he could make a complaint. He sighed. See you after school, mom. He shouts before leaving. He should have left a few minutes ago, as it's a long way to Saume which is in District 2. He's in District 4 so. It's about an hour away from where he lives which is why he needed to be up an hour early. When he arrived at the train station and saw that the train was almost there, he opened his rando's room and went through it to see if he put his tablet in there. He was pleased, but a little confused when he found it, as he was sure he left it in his room. He's going to assume he put it in there last night and just forgot about it. He left it there and went closer to ensure he didn't miss his train. Two minutes later the train arrived, and he walked on and sat down. He spent the whole ride talking with Felix and Emily using his tablet as his mom said he shouldn't talk on the train. He was discussing the agreement his parents and the staff of Saume came to. Today would be something like a trial run and based on how he feels at the end, his parents will decide whether or not I will continue going. They only did that because his father wouldn't stop trying to change his mom's mind. Felix assumed it was because his father thinks that after going to school by himself for a day, he would miss his sister who couldn't join the school as she failed the test. They gave her after his father kept trying to make them let her in too. It was a mess, but he's lucky because his mom was kind and patient and apologized for his behavior. They still let him join Saume because of that. While he thinks Saume will be better than Aldera, he doesn't know what to expect when he's enviably asked about his quirk. He isn't too sure 
if they will silently judge him like some of the teachers he's met in the past. Yes, he knew that the staff that brought over his uniform knew about his quirkless status, and they still treated him the same way they did at the science fair. But he isn't sure if it's because his parents were there, or if they genuinely didn't care. His thoughts were interrupted by his watch buzzing. He looked down before looking back at the tablet. Didn't Miss Nevermind tell you to stop overthinking everything? At least wait until you are at Saume Elementary, where there are trustable adults around, and a nurse's office. He chuckled at what Emily just said, before typing back. Sure the test of the ride was spent with him comparing and analyzing a couple of limelight heroes' villain takedowns. He was watching Green Empress take out a robber and save the hostages at the same time. His mom is a great hero. She should be the standard for a good hero. When he got a notification from Felix, you get off at the next stop. This is why he told Felix to memorize the route, for when he's not paying attention to what's going on around him. He puts his tablet away as he waits for the train to stop. Once it stops he runs off and heads in the direction of the school, with the occasional help from Felix when he makes the wrong turn. About ten minutes after he left the train station, he saw the faint outline of the school gate and quickened his pace. As he got closer he could see Shinzo's purple hair, and Roku's blue hair as well. He could also see black hair as well. He wondered who it belonged to. He jogged over and shouted, Good morning. I hope I wasn't keeping you guys waiting. He gave a smile as he walked closer. For some reason Shinso reached into his trouser pockets and pulled out a pair of shades. I told them that I needed these. They should make having these mandatory. Shinso muttered under his breath as Roku winced slightly. I will be bringing my own pair too just in case. He slowed to a walk as he looked at the woman with black hair. She smiled. We haven't been waiting too long Izuku. Not to mention, this is a long way from where you live. So you can be allowed to be about five minutes late. She turned towards the gate and knocked on it. Anyway since I'm sure you three already know each other's name, I will introduce myself. I'm Somatsumiki. I will be your homeroom teacher until you two graduate from Saume Elementary. I will also be your English teacher, she explained as they walked into the campus building. That was different from how things are at Aldera. You get a new homeroom teacher every year. Why are you going to be our homeroom teacher for so long? Roku asked as she looked at Soma-sensei in confusion. Because here every grade is put into one of five classrooms based on how they scored on the entrance exam. They walked through the courtyard, and she walked over to a board that had a map of the campus. Then a teacher will be assigned to that class until they graduate, and then the cycle repeats. She hands them all a piece of folded paper. He opens it to reveal it was a map. Since you three won the science fair and impressed the judges, you didn't have to take the entrance exam. She never lost her smile throughout this whole conversation. And what class are we in? 2A. Now before we go into the building, I will explain this. So, while there are a few classes and clubs that take place outside of the main building all of the classes are primarily contained in this single building. On each floor are the classes for that grade level and one or two clubs. As you two are in grade 2, you will be on the second floor, and Roku will be on the fourth floor as she's in grade 4. He and Shinso turned to Roku in surprise. You are nine. She nodded with a slight blush. I'll be ten in about two months. He couldn't believe this. He thought they were the same age as she was around their height, and didn't give off the air of superiority that the older kids at Aldera did. Ruko will be in 4A and will be in Yoshi-sensei's class. Soma-sensei said as he pouted, Roku-senpai. He should start referring to her as that now, he guesses. Only giggled when she saw his pout. He guesses that explains why Sensei kept saying you two instead of you three. The schedule among grades is usually the same with sometimes minor changes due to classes, but they mostly remain the same. He gave her all of his focus as he felt she was about to tell them something important. So, the schedule basically goes like this. From 6 o'clock to 7.55 is a break period before the day starts. You have to be on campus by at least 7.10. Most students use this time for their clubs, she turns to Roku. Normally a student in your grade would already be in at least one club so. Do you want to sign up for a club, now or wait until February when grade 2 will be deciding on clubs? She asked. Roku crossed her arms. She seemed to be thinking hard as her brows pitched together in her concentration. I'll join in February. That will give me time to decide what club I would like to join beforehand. Soma-sensei nodded and continued her description of the schedule. So from 8 o'clock to 8.55, there will be Japanese classes depending on the grade which class it is specifically would change. Only 55 minutes for a class. 
That doesn't seem like a lot of time, unless they are really simplifying the lessons. From 9 o'clock to 9.55 there will be math classes, yes, the less time the better. From 10 o'clock to 10.55 there will be English classes, and from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock there will be recess. So that's when everyone will be eating lunch. Wow, two hours for lunch, but only 55 minutes for actual classes. Sounds awesome but weird. During that time we also have clubs, that's why it's so long. She looked at him directly when she said that. Yes her purple eyes were pretty but they looked right through him like they were looking at something else. From 1 o'clock to 1.55 there will be history classes. From 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock there will be science classes. He tilted his head in confusion. They must be really good at summarizing these lessons, because they only have an hour for each class. And after that students in grades 2, and 1 with about half of the students in the other grades, go home as the rest stay until 5 for their club activities. He blinked. That was the third time she's mentioned students having club time. One in the mornings, one during recess, and one after school. How many clubs do they have? And more importantly, why do they give more time for clubs rather than actual classes? Is there some special benefit? Why, you three of course will have to wait until February for the explanation about the clubs properly. She then turned and hummed. Now, how about I show you to your class? She said as she pulled out a watch from her pocket. He glanced at his watch and looked at the time. 7.45. Time sure flies when you're walking around being told things. He also saw a text from Felix. I recorded this whole conversation. Just so you know. This is one of the reasons why he's glad he gave them the ability to think freely and do whatever they wanted. Wait. Shinso finally speaks up since they walked into the school. Now that his shades were off he could see his face. He looked as sleepy as he did the day they met at the science fair. Yeah, Shinso. When do we have homeroom? You didn't mention it anywhere in the schedule. Izuku's eyes widened. He didn't notice that. And based on Roku's face, neither did she. Oh, I forgot. We usually have it from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. She calmly answered as they headed up a flight of stairs. We will head to my class where we will meet up with Yoshi-sensei who's taking over from my class. After that, he will return to his class with Roku. They all nodded and walked onto the second floor, down the hall. He could see a man around the height of his father with brown hair. He was too far to see the eye's color, but he knew that once he was close enough, he'd be able to see them. They walked down the hall as he marveled at how quiet it was, and also at how much space is between each classroom door. When they passed classroom 2B he turned to them, allowing them to see his yellow snake-like eyes. Hello, I assume you are my new student, Ruko Aoi. He had a nice smooth voice. It reminded him of Uncle Masaru when he was talking to clients, unlike when his kids and wife are having extremely loud shouting matches. Yes, sorry, yes that's me Yoshi-sensei. She says with a small bow before he turns his attention to Soma-sensei. Soma-chan, your kids were wonderful. I will be heading to my class now. This way, Roku-chan. She gave them a quick goodbye before walking after him. Soma-sensei walks into the classroom and makes a stay here motion. Good morning class. Good morning Soma-sensei. Sorry, I missed most of homeroom today, but, as I'm sure you all know, we have two new students today. She seems to love her students and based on her behavior all day, he's sure he can classify her as being better than the teachers he's used to. Now, be on your best behavior as they introduce themselves. She turns to them. You can come in now. They look at each other before he walks in nervously with Shinso walking behind him. He looks down as the fear from his old school comes back causing him to be unable to look up at any of them. Why don't you introduce yourself first, Shinso? List your name, age, birthday, your favorite hero, and your quirk. He assumes Shinsi gave her a confused look because she then said, We just added the last two cause the class wouldn't stop asking that to everyone who walks into the classroom. Okay, my name is Shinso Hitoshi. I'm seven years old and my birthday is July 1st. My favorite hero is Eraserhead and my quirk is brainwashing. Izuku had to bite his tongue to keep himself from going on a rant about his quirk. Yes, he knows Shinso used it on him during the science fair. He can't help but want to ask a thousand questions about it. He grabbed his vest tightly as he heard Soma-sensei clap. Great job, Shinso, Izuku. He could feel his watch buzzing like crazy, but he didn't go to check it. He took a deep breath and said in a low voice, I'm Yagi Izuku. I'm seven and my birthday is July 15th. I have two heroes tied for my favorite. They are Green Empress, 
he heard a light scoff from Shinzo. So he felt great pleasure as he revealed how his other favorite was. And a racer head. He could practically hear the sound of Shinzo whipping his head in his direction. And Om, I wasn't born with a quirk. Very specific wording. Please remember this for future reference. He's told people this a lot over the last year or so. It comes as natural as saying hello. There was dead silence for a moment as he heard the sound of paper shuffling. Ah, yes. Here it is. He still didn't lift his head as he heard her whispering something to herself. Though he did wonder what she was holding. So, Yagi. You will be sitting next to Yeyurazu Momo and Himiko Toga. Shinso will be sitting beside Mito Monoma. You three raise your hands. She heard her say as he heard a voice in his head. Good job, kid. Now, please look up so you know where to sit. He recognized it as Soma-sensei's voice, but he knew it was only him who heard it. He looked up as he began to theorize about it. Was that some sort of telepathy quirk? Can she also read minds or just talk to others in their heads? He saw two girls in the back with their hands raised. He assumed that they were Yeyurazu and Himiko. He walked over and sat down at the desk between them. He could also see Shinzo sitting beside a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. He looked at the girls on both sides of him. One on his right had black hair and eyes, and the one on his left had blonde hair and yellow eyes. He doesn't know who is which, but he's sure he'll find out by the end of the day. Okay, now we have five minutes before the first period starts. He looks up to see Soma-sensei at the board. Tanaka-sensei will be here to start your lesson on grammar in a few minutes. Now stay in your seats. You can socialize with the new students during recess. I will be back at 10. Have a nice day. She then left the classroom as the students started whispering among each other. Hi, Yagi, right? The girl on his right asked. He nodded. Yes, that's me. Though I prefer being called Izuku. She nodded. Oh, you're like me. My name is Toga Himiko, but I asked everyone to call me Himiko. The girl on his left, Himiko said, jumping into the conversation. He looked at the one on his right. If she's Himiko then I assume you're Yeyurazu. She nodded with a smile. Nice to meet you, I'm Momo Yeyurazu. You can call me Momo since we'll be sitting together until middle school most likely. He tilted his head in confusion, causing Momo to giggle. Me and Himiko have been sitting beside each other since preschool. She explained as he hummed. Hey, hey, let's eat lunch together. We can talk then. Tanaka-sensei should walk in any second. Himiko said excitedly as he nodded. He locked eyes with Shinso. He gave a tiny smirk as their teacher walked in. All right, kids. I hope you had a pleasant break. Now, we're going to talk about fractions today. Yep, these kids are way ahead of his classmates who are still learning odd and even numbers. He took out his notebook to jot down the important bits to remember. So, if you take a pie and cut three slices, and then divide those slices in half. You take one slice, that means you took one, what? So, your favorite hero is Eraserhead, too? Shinso asked, leaning on his desk. It was now recess time and most of the class already left the classroom. So, it's only them and a few others here. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone else say that they even know he exists, much less says that he's their favorite. He answers as he goes through his randos room. He pulls out his tablet. Hey, Felix, open my files please, he asked before looking up at Shinso. Yes. Shinso. Did you bring your own lunch today? Shinzo blinked. What? Did you bring your own lunch? He repeated as he stared at him. No, my father's had to rush off to work. He smiles. Great I accidentally made two bentos today. He reached and pulled out the bento that was wrapped in a yellow and black cloth and sat it down in front of Shinso. Here, you can have it. Shinso grabbed it with a hesitant look. Why did you make two? He scratched his cheek in embarrassment. I usually made myself two lunches because, he looks away. Ah, people would take your lunch, Shinso said, seeming to understand what he was implying. Wait, I can assume why Green Empress is your favorite by why Eraserhead too. When I first heard you say Green Empress, I thought you were like one of those lame losers who only chose her because she's so well known. But, then you said Eraserhead as well. He tilted his head, as he explained kind of panicking near the end. I'm not judging as I like him too but, why? Hey, saved me last year, after I was. He trailed off at the end. But he gets the feeling he doesn't need to elaborate any further. Oh, well, what was it like? Being rescued by him? He remembered. For some reason, all of the pain I was feeling made me forget some things but, everything from the moment he saved me until I went to bed that night, I still remember clearly. He laid his head on the desk. 
he kicked down the door and used his scarf to hold the mad scientist in place and carefully took me out of the building. He then remembered something. Recovery girl appeared to recognize his surname. So, she must know his parents. What are you losers talking about on this fine day? They turned to see the boy Shinso sitting beside Monoma. I think that was the name. Himiko was behind him giving him a disapproving look. I apologize for my stupid brother. She said as she slid into her seat. Hey, I'm not stupid I'm just above these. Lower your voice will you? Shinso interrupts him with a glare as he whines. He hopes this isn't a back you go to. Zero. Oh, did I hurt your ears? Sorry, I'm still getting used to my quirk. Himiko smirks before exclaiming. Why don't we introduce ourselves to you too? My name is Toga Himiko. Call me Himiko, please. Oh, and my quirk is transform. She looked away when she talked about her quirk. My name is Monomanito, and my wonderful quirk is Copycat. He was still quite loud, but not as much as a minute ago. Copycat? Does your quirk allow you to copy the quirks of others? He asked as Monoma freezes before nodding. That sounds cool. And so, does yours Himiko? She nodded with a frown as she stared into space. I guess, I'm not allowed to use it. He blinked in confusion. He guessed being able to transform yourself into other people wouldn't be a very good quirk for a seven-year-old to have. He shrugged. Sounds less dangerous than the quirks of Izumi's friends. Um, well you heard me introduce myself earlier, but I'm Yagi Izuku. Please call me Izuku. Monoma nodded with a hum. I will make sure to remember it. You better remember mine for the day when I become a hero. Izuku stared silently, as Shibso looked away with a scoff. Sure, if you have the drive for it, then I'm sure you can become a good hero. He answered honestly as he does believe that. He believes that anyone, even Izumi and her friends, could become really good heroes if certain parts of their personality were taken out of the conversation. All three of them looked at him with complicated looks before Shinso and Himiko whispered at the same time. Do you think someone with a dangerous villainous quirk could become a hero as well? What kind of question is that? He thought to himself as he tilted his head in confusion. Himiko and Shinso also turned to each other in surprise, as they started to intricate each other. He assumes they thought they were the only ones in their situation which they were not. All quirks if you get down to it are dangerous. It's that some are more obviously dangerous than others. He listened to their words as they went back and forward as he began to understand something about Himiko he noticed. She pretends a lot. He would know as a majority of his life, now is pretending he's alright, and not traumatized by what happened. He got lost in thought until felt someone shake him. H.M.? He looks up to see Monoma there in front of him as Himiko and Shinso look at him expectantly. You never answered their question, Monoma explained, making him realize he in fact did not answer their question. Oh, sorry. They both deflated and looked away sadly. Why are you too upset? I was saying sorry for not answering your question. They perked back up. Anyway my answer is yes. No quirk is villainous. It's how it's used that makes it somewhat villainous. But, even in that case, it's the person, not the quirk that's villainous. His mom believes that too. He knows cause he saw her cheer up a crying boy because he accidentally burned someone badly with his flame quirk. She told him it was an accident and that he can still be a hero as long as he learns to use his flames to protect instead of harming others. He looks at Himiko. Himiko. I'm not too sure what the situation with your quirk is but, based on what you said, I assume your quirk gives you some unwanted side effects. Or unwanted urges. She tensed up. I'm not going to tell you to answer the question but, that was a little observation I wanted to get out. Along with this warning, if you're attempting to hold back your quirk by force, then stop because that turns you into a ticking time bomb. Find little ways to use your quirk safely before something bad happens. He left it at that and pulled out his tablet before leaving the room. The next hour consisted of him getting interrogated by Emily about his mental health. Over the watch's text feature, of course. They can only talk out loud through the speaker which they can't do while in school. Maybe he should make an earbud so they can talk to me through. Hmm, future project idea. But that's not the point. He was using the map to both explore the school and to test the capabilities of both Felix and the tablet holographic screen. He was trying to make a 3D map of the school, but that means he has to go into every room and hallway. So, it's taking a bit of time, and he didn't want to go to lunch right away as he brought his own. He had a very specific destination in mind, as he was making the 3D map. He just made too many stops as he made the 3D map. He made it so that it would be the last stop he made before going to lunch. He saw the big doors and quickened his pace. 
Once he was in front of the doors he turned off the holographic screen as Felix started storing the map in his files without him asking. He touched the doors lightly before they opened to reveal his final destination, the library. He walked in amazed as he took the sight of the library. It was gigantic. It looked to have five floors, though he couldn't see what was on floors three to five. He looked around as he walked further in. Each shelf looked to be seven feet tall with three ladders on each row. He wondered where the school got so many books. He had wandered into the science section, and he caught sight of a book on coding. As he, Felix, and Emily discussed the logistics of him checking the book out, he was questioning why this book was here. This is college-level stuff. Why is this in the library of an elementary school? He wondered to himself as he remembered something he saw on the map Soma-sensei gave him earlier. It said that the middle and high school used to also be on the same campus as the elementary school. The school never changed the books when the middle and high schools were given separate buildings with their own dedicated libraries. They do say that kids who graduate from Saume, no matter which class it is are usually smarter than the average middle schooler. He assumes this might be part of the reason why. He was brought out of his musings by the sound of a boy yelling. Hey, you can't have tablets at school. We are here to learn, not to spend our time playing games. He looked to see a boy who looked to be his age. He had blue hair and eyes and was wearing glasses, looked very tightly and put together. He was making a chopping motion with his hands. Are you talking about me? He asked after looking around confused. Yes, I'm talking to you. Who else is here with a tablet? The boy shouted pointing at the tablet in his hands. Um, sorry but, are you allowed to shout in the library? He asked quietly as he assumed that there would be the same rules here as they would at any other library. No ahem sorry, you are correct as it was being too loud. But, that doesn't change the fact that you are walking around with a tablet. He whispered and shouted. I don't think there was a rule saying no electronics during school hours. Just no using them in class, unless given permission. He calmly explained back to hide the rising panic that was flooding his systems. Huh, I guess you are right about that. The boy muttered looking away before whipping his head in his direction. My name is Ida Tenya, and I sincerely apologize for the builder I made. He bowed as he accidentally started shouting again. He felt his sweat drop as he looked at him before he introduced himself. I'm Yagi Izuku, and it's okay please stop bowing. He waved his arms around in the air. I already know your name, Yagi-kun. I am in the same class as you. Ida said as he lifted his head. But, may I ask what are you doing with the tablet? Izumi decided to answer honestly and asked Felix to open the map back up. I was using it to make a 3D map of the school building. And when I got here I was used to talking with Felix and Emily. His eyes seemed to light up for a moment. You're the quirkless kid who made two highly advanced eyes along with three other things aren't you? He started at him confused about how he knew that. From what he knew the students of Saomei didn't have to participate in the science fair if they weren't in one of the various science clubs. Oh, my mother told me about the results of the science fair. She was one of the judges this year. He explained as if noticing his confusion. He nodded as it made sense as Ida looked down at the book he was holding. Are you planning to check that out? He looked and Ida looked up with a smile. To make up for my shameful behavior earlier, I will show you how to check your book out here. He then grabbed him and led him back to the front. Do you have your school ID yet? He asked when they got to the desk. He didn't remember if he had got an ID or not. He has one. It's in the Randausaru, near the front in the small black box. Felix instructed as he went through the bag. Wow, he is actually capable of free thought, Ida whispered in amazement. Yeah, and thank all might, he cringed saying that. He is because if he wasn't then I would have had a lot more trouble. They both are more reliable than my own brain, though I think they may need some fine tuning. He said as he pulled out the black box Felix was talking about. He opened it and saw what looked like a passport with the school's symbol on it. Is this it? Yes. Felix simply said as Ida grabbed the ID. So, the first thing you need to do is scan this in. Five minutes later, he was leaving the library with his new book safely tucked away in his bag. Felix, he was holding a slip that the machine gave him after he checked out the book. In three weeks I will remind you to return the boom before it's overdue. He smiled as he made his way to the courtyard. He heard the school has a gorgeous floor bed in the courtyard that is maintained by the gardening club. Due to not observing his surroundings he missed the girl with red hair looking at him from down the hall. Is that? He walked outside and looked around wondering where to sit when his name was shouted. Izuku, over here. He looked to see Toga, Momo, Manama, 
and Shinso all sitting together under a big tree. He smiled and walked over. Were you at the library? Momo asked when she saw the slip in his hand. Yeah, I was making a 3D map of the school on my way there. It's easier than looking for the diagram of every floor. He explained. And it's most likely guarded by your AI. Shinso said with a smirk, and he felt his cheeks puff up as he huffed. Am I wrong? Nope. That's exactly what he wanted the 3D map for. Emily said with a cackle. He briefly wondered if those two were being more vocal, until he remembered they could talk with his mom for hours. They don't trust most people, so they usually stay quiet around others until they ask them for something. The fact that Emily and Felix are both being more vocal, well at least during times he can have the tablet out without getting in trouble, that is, means they don't see the students here as threats. It makes him a little relieved. Is that another one? The voice is different. Shinso asked as Izuku remembered the only Shinso technically met was Felix. Yeah, this is Emily. I think she was the one who burned that kid. He said as he remembered the situation. Shinso laughed as everyone looked confused and worried by that comment. Burned? Your AI burned someone? How? She asked slightly, raising her voice at the end. Someone touched one of the electronics I brought to the science fair with permission. And since they were programmed to burn anyone who touches my things if I'm not there. Izuku explained as Shinso added. And then some teacher attempted to sabotage his experiment when he wasn't there by using one of her star students. He said star student mockingly, causing Himiko to laugh. Ah, so it was deserved, Monoma said blankly as Momo still looked a little worried. As part of our programming, we have to give the offender three warnings. The first and second warnings are verbal, while a burn is the third warning. They only give a light first-degree burn. If they continue despite those warnings, then they will be given either a second or three RD degree burn. Emily explained to Momo. She seemed to sense what Momo's worry was. So no innocent person will be burned if they accidentally touch the devices. Oh, and the kid ignored all three of the warnings and even mocked Izu. So, he has only himself and his teacher to blame for his 2ND degree burn. That made Momo relax a little. Were you worried that you guys would accidentally get burned? He asked as Momo nodded a little embarrassed. Well, considering how much Emily seems to trust you, then you would only get burned if I specifically told her to. Plus, you would get a rather loud warning too beforehand. He goes and sits down and pulls out his bento. Now, what happened after I left? Himiko and Shinso seem a lot closer than they did before. They both jump up and start explaining as he enjoys his lunch. After that lunch went by very quickly with him learning that they had ended up talking in private about their quirks and bonded over their similar experiences. Himiko told him that she thought about what he said and will try to find better ways before she tries to ask him for advice. She said she wasn't ready to tell him what was so villainous about her quirk. He understood that sentiment as he doesn't want to tell others about his either. After lunch ended, when they were on their way to class Shinso complimented him on his cooking, which had him embarrassed as he only let his mother try his cooking so far. The next two classes were kind of boring, to be honest. Though they were told that next school year, they will be allowed to start doing classwork in the chemistry lab. Though by the end of the day, he did come to realize why kids that graduate from Saume are so smart. While they have less time for classes than students from other schools, the lessons are simple and easy to digest despite the complicated topics. He was able to understand what the class was learning, even though it was his first day. He was sure that he will be able to catch up with the class soon enough. Though he and Shinso have a lot of work to catch up on, Momo and Tenya, who he learned was their class president and vice president, even offered to help them with their work. He was now about to get off at his stop, as he started to wind down from the excitement of today. As the train stopped, and he ran off he realized something. He wanted to continue going to Saume despite what his father and Izumi believed. He ran all the way home in his excitement to tell his mom about his day, while loudly shouting for him to slow down. He didn't stop until he could see his mom standing in the doorway. Mom! He shouted as he literally jumped at her. Catching him was really easy for her to do because of not only her quirk, but because she is actually very strong physically, and he doesn't weigh as much as a kid his age should. Whoa, how was your first day of school? She asked as she carried him inside. It was great. The campus is big. The teachers were nice, and the lessons were really easy to learn despite how late into the school year I joined. He shouted as she sat down on the couch in the living room. And the students? They're really nice too. I think I made five new friends. 
Oh, and you remember, Roku-senpai. She nodded a little confused. She was the one that won third place, right? He nodded his head rapidly. He wondered how his head was still attached to his body. Yes, that's her. Turns out she's going to be ten in two months. She smiled. Wow, I thought she was around your age. She said in a little hearted tone before her facial expression shifted to serious as she looked at him. Izuku, do you want to continue attending Saomei? She asked. And don't feel pressure due to how your father feels about this. He smiled brightly. Yes, I already made a 3D map of the school. And I have to explore the library before I graduate. It's huge. She smiled as it looked like his excitement was contagious. Okay, I will make sure to tell the head that you will be staying at Saomei Elementary later. She stood back up as he looked at her confused. Izumi and your father aren't here yet, she explained as she went and grabbed her jacket and shoes. So, why don't me and you go and get some ice cream to celebrate you having such a great first day? He smiled more today than he has in a while. He realized as he felt a giant full tooth grin come on his face. Yes, let's mix a lot of flavors and toppings this time. She chuckled as she agreed, and they left the house. They came back an hour later as Izuku was regretting the abomination he created this time. He mixed rainbow, cookies and cream, cotton candy, and peanut butter ice cream with toppings consisting of cherries, both chocolate and caramel fudge, nuts, cookies, whipped cream, gummy bears, and sprinkles. His head was suffering from a really bad case of brain freeze and his stomach was doing gymnastics as he fought the urge to throw up. His mother was carrying him again as he couldn't walk due to his stomach literally trying to kill him. She tried to talk him out of it, but he was persistent and did it anyway. She rubbed his back as she whispered assurances. She told him to go to sleep when they got home. She was hoping he'll be able to sleep it off. He had his head buried in her neck, so he couldn't see what was right in front of them when she opened the door. Though he didn't need to guess because his father said, Well, he's assuming that he wanted to know whether or not he wanted to stay at Saume. And based on his tone of voice, he thinks it's going his way. Though he can't blame him as he was being carried in a hold that most parents carry their kids in when they're sad. But, not sad. He's in pain. He wants to stay. But can we talk about this later? She asked as they walked in. She sat him down, and they took off their shoes and put on their house slippers. He sat there as his father insisted that they talk about it now. So, then we are allowing Izumi to go to Saomei as well? He asked, and they both sighed. Their good mood was ruined by that one line. No, she's right at home at Aldra. His mom said as she picked him back up. And before his father could say anything else, she stopped him. Why don't we ask Izumi whether she wants to go to Saomei or not, but you do realize that if she chooses to go, then you will be the one paying for her to go there. He looked up at his father and saw the way his face stretched up. Why do we have to pay for her and not Izuku? He sweat dropped. His father really doesn't pay that much attention to anything having to do with him, does he? His mother didn't even respond as she left and walked up the stairs to his room. She sat him on the bed and softly said, Could you change out of your uniform into something more comfortable before going to sleep? He nodded slowly as his head stung. Okay, don't worry. I'll deal with your father. Just go to sleep. I'll wake you up for dinner later. She said before leaving and closing the door. He slowly moved off the bed as a wave of nausea hit him. Was what he did stupid? Yes. Was he going to do it again in the future? Also, yes. He got dressed as Emily told him to move the trash can near his bed in case he threw up. She didn't bother to scold him for the very stupid decision he made as Felix told him he memorized that specific combination for when he goes next time. He crawled into bed, deciding to take a shower in the morning, as he didn't think his stomach would be able to handle the journey to his shower from his bed. Just as he fell asleep and began to overtake him, the door was thrown open. Hey, loser! He weakly opened his eyes as a tiny whimper left his mouth. There was a period of silence for a second. He saw them taking in his new room. He could understand their shock as his room didn't have any of his All Might merch that it used to, and instead had heroes that most of them don't know. Or some people who aren't heroes, like the poster of a few old K-pop groups from centuries ago that he managed to recreate in his art room. He didn't really care as he tried to pull the covers over his head, before they were yanked away by Katsumi. Hey, nerd! Just because you go to a new fancy school for rich kids doesn't make you better than us. Get up and face us. She screamed as he groaned her voice making his headache worse. Not now, please, Suchin, please. He begged a sit seemed to work because she pulled the covers back over his head and said, fine. He peacefully went to sleep with a single thought. 
I need to invest in some high-quality locks for my rooms. Izumi walked back to her room with Katsumi and Shoko. She thought about the last five minutes. She and her friends decided to mess with Izuku a little. But, as it was late, she said that only the girls will go today, and the boys can bother him next time. When they opened the door they were surprised by what they saw. There wasn't any All Might merch hanging on his walls. Which stunned them as they know his favorite hero is All Might. She didn't recognize most of the people decorating his room. She was about to get hopeful when she saw posters for Green Empress, Midnight, Miss Joke, and a Sir Night Eye pen on his desk. Her thoughts on him being a fan of Midnight aside, she knew he hadn't given up on his dream yet. And it appeared Katsumi came to the same conclusion as she walked over and ripped the covers from him. She doesn't know what he said as he whispered the next words, but Katsumi tucked him back in and said to try again tomorrow. What happened? It hasn't even been three minutes. Katsuki shouted when they got back to her bedroom. She shrugged as Shoko answered his question. I don't know. Katsumi decided to let him off for today. Katsuki ripped his head in her direction and shouted, Why? She glared at him as the air got heavy and Shoto shook his head with a sigh. Did something happen? Cause you normally wouldn't deviate from the plan like Shoko. Now she was also glaring at the boys. My job is making sure you four don't go too far with your bullying. You don't want him to commit suicide now do you? She asked with a growl as she tense up at the thought. Yes, she bullies her younger brother. But she doesn't want him to kill himself. The others also went silent before Katsuki quietly said. Because he begged me too. They looked at her confused. He begged you to leave him alone so. You left him alone? Katsuki asked slowly. She moved away as she had the feeling he was about to blow up. That's the reason why. He looked like he was fucking sick. And he hasn't begged us for anything since we started bullying him. If you saw him you would have stopped as well. Asshole. She stood up and shouted. Causing Shoko to jump between them. Hey, hey stop. No fighting in anyone's room besides your own. Rule 15. She shouted. Reminding them of the rules they came up with for sleepovers. There was a knock on the door. Hey, are you kids fighting again? The door opened as her mom poked her head in. No, auntie, we're just a little heated, Katsumi said, sitting back down. Okay, could you keep the volume down? Izuku's not feeling too well. Oh and Izumi, could you come down for a minute? She agreed as her mom left. She had just confirmed what Katsumi said. Izuku wasn't feeling well. I'll be back in a few minutes. She said as she stood up and left the room. So, I will be handing these out now. You will all have to join at least one club next year so. Here are the flyers for all the clubs. Soma Sensei explained as she walked around putting a packet on everyone's desk. You have until the week before school ends to join a club. So you have quite a while before you need to join a club. It's been a month since he joined Saume Elementary. He knew that next year he would have to join a club, but he wasn't expecting to have to make a decision so soon. Then again, it is February, and the school year ends in March. He sighed as he leaned back. Now he has faced one of the most difficult questions he was ever going to receive until he goes to Saume Middle. What club does he join? As he walked home his eyes were trained on the packet in his hands, rather than on what was in front of him. He knew that Saume had great pride in their clubs, considering more time is dedicated to their clubs than all of the main classes combined. They had a lot of really interesting ones, like cooking, coding, light music, rock, pop, dance, fashion, and gardening. He had so many he wanted to try, but he could only at the most pick three. He knows that in Saume Middle School, he will have the opportunity to join another club, if he manages to test out of one of the main courses. So, he could save one for them. But there are like 50 clubs, he pouted as he continued to flip through the pages. If I could find at least one, I want more than anything else. Maybe Ko he bumped into someone and fell to the ground. He groaned as he heard a similar voice. Izu, gosh, it's been forever since I've seen you. You should come over more often. I'll have to convince those brats to invite you over instead of your sister. He looks up. Auntie, could you help me up? She laughed and lifted him with one arm. Is he that light? So, what made you so distracted that you were ignoring all basic safety protocols? She asked with a smile. He looked down. Auntie is very smart, like her kids. She might be able to give him some advice. Um, Auntie. Could you give me some advice? Huh, sure. They were sitting in a nearby Starbucks as he explained the situation. So, your new school is requiring you to join at least one club, but you can have only three clubs max. He nodded as he drank his cup of caffeine and sugar. Yeah, but, the issue is that there are multiple clubs that I want to try. 
Auntie picks up the packet and looks through it. Well, the flyers go into a lot of deal about the club so I would recommend you read through all the descriptions carefully and then slowly start to narrow the list down until you have the number of clubs you want. He hummed. It was a brilliant idea if you asked him. This is why Kakin and Suchin are so smart. Both auntie and uncle are smart and they got it from them. It's a miracle he isn't dumb like his father. A trait that Izumi, unfortunately, inherited from their idiot father. Now only if she had blonde hair as well. He sat the empty mug down and smiled. Thank you, auntie. You really helped me out. She smiled and ruffled his hair. Feel free to talk to me if you need any assistance. Okay, Izuku? They left Starbucks shortly after that, and she walked him home. Apparently, the twins were there, and she went to pick them up. Deku. What are you doing out mom you piece of shit? Katsuki shouts before he gets punched in the head by Auntie. Stop tainting Izuku's ear you stupid brat. She shouted as she dragged the twins out of the house with a lot of curses. Have a nice day, Auntie. He shouts as she closes the door. He sat down and took off his shoes. What were you doing with Auntie anyway? Izumi asked from behind him. He gave her and the Todoroki twins a glance before sighing. I ran into her on my way home from school. Happy? That seemed to make her satisfied. Not Shoto who only frowned. You usually get home 30 minutes ago. You're a half hour late. So what were you doing? He asked as Izuku paused. He didn't realize that Shoto paid his schedule any mind. I asked her for some advice. He stood up and was about to walk to the stairs. Advice on what? Shoto asked following him. Why are you following me? To get you to answer the question. He sighed again. Figuring out what club to join. What club did you choose? I haven't chosen one yet. He rolled his eyes wondering what was with Shoto's sudden interest in his school life. I see. Can I have a cupcake? Bingo. If you wanted a cupcake, you could have asked downstairs instead of following me to my room. He walked past Izumi's room to get to the stairs to the third floor. For some reason the staircases are on opposite sides of the house. Because I'm not supposed to eat anything you made. But your food is good so. I have to resort to asking in secret. He stops and turns to Shoto. What do they mean you're not supposed to have any of my cooking? Shoto sweat dropped. Cause the others don't believe in your cooking skills. So, they banned all of your food. Though the only ones to follow said ban are Katsuki and Izumi. He groaned as he walked up the stairs. You know what? Since they ban my food, I will happily smuggle you three some of my desserts and food whenever I'm in the mood. Which will end up being a lot because he enjoys seeing people enjoying his cooking. Even people he isn't particularly fond of are included. He opens the door to his art room. The right side of the room is still normal, but the left side of his room has been converted into a kitchen for his hobby. His mom randomly installed it as a surprise as a Lunar New Year's gift. He walked over to the storage area after telling Shoto to stand outside. He doesn't allow people besides his mother in here, for some reason. He opened the storage closet and saw he had a container of red velvet cupcakes in a small packaging on the shelf. He grabbed the container and counted the cupcakes inside. Four. He took out one and handed the container to Shoto. You find out how to hide them from Izumi. Now bye. He closed the door to the art room as automatic locks clicked into place. He then entered his bedroom and threw his bag on the bed as he sat at his desk. He placed the packet on the table and flipped through making sure to carefully read each flyer. Every time he made it to the end of the packet he checked a few clubs off the list and went through it again marking the ones he said no to. After about 30 or so minutes he had made his choice. He went downstairs to let his mother know that he will be coming home late tomorrow. The next day he downed a whole mug of hot chocolate and left the house at 4.55 am. He woke up 30 minutes ago. Why was he up at his unholy hour? He had to get to school early because according to what Soma-sensei said yesterday, if they ended up joining a morning club, they had to show up to school at 6 to sign up, and then participate in the club activity. And since one of the ones he chose was a morning club, he had to leave early. It took a lot of convincing for his mom to let him leave so early. Which isn't good as based on his opinion of the club, he would be leaving that early every day. He walked up to the school gate around 5.50, and he was led to the attendance office by Felix. He arrived to see that not a lot of kids were there, so he stood in line. He yawned, wishing he was allowed to have a cup of coffee instead of a cup of hot chocolate. After about five minutes of waiting, he made it to the faint and handed his slip over. So, Yagi-kun, you want to join the dance club, gymnastics club, and cooking club, right? 
The lady at the front asked. Yes, ma'am. She nodded and typed something on her computer. The printer then went off as she handed two pieces of paper. The first was a schedule and the other was a permission slip. You will go to dance in the morning, so after you leave here, head for the dance club. The location of the clubs is on your new schedule. During recess, you will have your cooking club and finally after classes end, you will have your gymnastics club. The permission slip is something for you to give your club leader to let them know that you want to join their club. Monday morning during homeroom, you will have to tell your teacher whether or not you want to stay in the clubs you join. She explained. He nodded as Felix gave a signal that he recorded the whole explanation for later. He thanked her and left the office. As he walked down the halls, he left Felix to scan the schedule to mark down the location of his clubs. His dance club was on the fourth floor, so that's where he went. As he walked there he thought to himself about how to ensure he isn't dead on his feet when he arrives at the dance club from now on. His first thought was just to stock up on excessive amounts of coffee, but Emily shot that idea down in five seconds. She then suggested he just go to sleep earlier than before which means he has to do hero analysis on the weekends instead of every night like he's been doing previously. Which means he will be doing that tomorrow as it is Friday. He has the whole weekend to decide the best method of tackling this issue. He stopped in front of room 453. He took a couple of deep breaths before opening the door. There were maybe 20 or so kids in the room. He tried to find where the teacher was, but couldn't so he walked in further. He found her talking to a girl that looked very familiar to him, but he showed her his permission slip as he was told to. She smiled at him as she handed him his slip back. Hello, Yagi-kun. I'm Chiko Katani. I'll be your dance instructor. Now today we were dividing everyone into groups of at most five people. You can go around and see if there's a group you want to join. He can join our Chiko sensei. He looked at the girl who looked familiar. She had purple hair with teal streaks and gray eyes. She. Amiya? He remembers why she looked so familiar now. He can't believe he almost forgot about the four friends he made when he was kidnapped. She squeals excitedly before grabbing his arm and dragging him somewhere. I knew it was you when I saw you. I know only one boy with green hair and eyes. Oh, did you grow out your hair, Izuku? It's longer than I remember. She started rambling as she dragged him through the crowd of students. Yes, I'm glad you noticed. And where are you dragging me? To the others, of course. She finally stops, and he looks to see Katashi, Akihiro, and Azami who immoderately turned to Katashi with a victorious look. I told you I wasn't imagining things. Katashi rubbed the back of his neck nervously. Yes, I can see that. Sorry for doubting you. Akihiro walked closer and said nothing for a minute. Did you grow your hair out? Why is that the first thing they noticed when only his mother and auntie noticed before? Um, yeah. So, you four go here as well? They nodded as Emiya said. We have so much catching up to do. Yeah, we do but, I don't think we can have that long talk here, Katashi said, looking down with a frown. Do you happen to have an afternoon club, Izuku? Yeah, I have gymnastics. Azami makes a face. Really, two clubs involving physical exercise? He had got reminded of Izumi for a second, and as if she realized she elongated more. You will be burning a lot of calories, Izuku. You need to ensure you eat enough food to make up for all the calories you will lose. Oh, it's for a scientific reason. That made him feel really warm inside. I will, Azami. She nodded, looking pleased as a Kahiro hummed. So, since all of us have afternoon clubs, then we should meet up after they end. I could ask my mom to drop all of us home so we don't have to walk so late. That seems reasonable but, your mom? Yeah, she works with the school so, we don't have to wait, and she knows about what happened when all of us met. He shrugged as Azami hummed in agreement. Yeah, it's either that or my grandma so, his mom it is. They spent the rest of the club, learning the different warm-ups with help from Katashi, who is a grade above them so. This is his second year. Overall it was a very good experience, and he was excited about his next club. But, seeing the friends he made when he was kidnapped made him remember something he had been thinking about. About a month ago Shinso opened up to him and explained how his situation was before he was adopted by his new dads. He felt guilty and felt like he didn't trust Shinso as much as he trusted him because he couldn't get himself to tell him about what happened when he was six. He walked to his Japanese literature class with a heavy mind and heart. After math class was over, he practically ran down to the first floor. His cooking club was in room 135. Quickly found it as it was the first room on the left. He stepped in and saw what looked like a mini restaurant set up as he walked over to the counter 
where a man who he was assuming was their club instructor. Hello, are you here for the club or to eat? If you're here to eat, then please come back at twelve. If not then please show me your slip. He said it quickly and fluidly, as if he's done this multiple times before. He silently showed him his permission slip. Okay, Yagi-kun. Is there a specific way you want to be addressed? He nodded. By my first name please. The man hummed and wrote something down on his clipboard. Okay, go back out and enter through the pink door. He thanked the man and entered the kitchen. There were fewer students here than at his dance class, twenty at the most. Ah, Izuku. You joined the cooking club? He looked and saw Roku-senpai. Roku-senpai, you're joined as well? He asked, hugging her. Yeah, I always liked cooking, so it seemed to fit. Also, call me Aoi. He smiled up at her. Okay, Aoi-senpai. She smiled back as the instructor entered the kitchen with one more student following him in. Ahem. Uh -huh. Okay. So, cooking club members, you do whatever you want as I lay out the rules to the new potential members. Majority of the students nodded and went through the cabinets pulling a few pans and ingredients down onto the counter. So, if you choose to stay, I will be your cooking instructor. My name is Shiraki Narita, but you will call me Chef Shiraki. Chef Shiraki got it. That doesn't sound too hard. Izuku thought to himself as Chef Shiraki continued. Here in the cooking club, we pride ourselves on the food we make rather than on the things you would normally use to describe yourself. So, when we go around and introduce ourselves, we are going to tell our preferred name and what we are best at making. They all looked around at each other as Izuku felt like he was going to love this club as well. If he was actually still quirkless, he would have been overjoyed. His clubmates seemed to struggle a little when it came to introducing themselves without mentioning their quirk, but most of them got it. He noticed most of them were only good at making either simple meals or Japanese food only. I'm Aoi and I specialize in Italian food. Oh, his mouth is watering. He's going to beg his mom for some Alfredo, as Izumi picked the meal last week. Nice to meet you, Aoi. I hope you remain here. It's been so long since we had anyone specializing in anything that isn't Japanese. He then looks at him, oh, it was his turn now. I'm Izuku, I specialize more in European and American foods along with baking. He knows this because he has sneakily been cooking all of their American dinners now and no one complains when he secretly cooks European foods either. Would Italian foods count as European? His mom is better at making pasta dishes than him. Wow, it appears we have a mini master chef here. I'm expecting good things from you. He then went on to the next student as he thought more about what he wanted to bake tonight. Shoto has been coming to him to smuggle desserts secretly so often that they just agreed on a date when he can come and get whatever dessert he leaves in the cabinet. Though he made a few rules about how much he can take of each. Now that you all have introduced yourselves, let's go over the rules. He looked back up at Chef Shiraki. I only have five very simple rules. No bullying. No quirks are allowed, unless it's a mutant quirk. You are free to use the kitchen whenever you want as long as you clean up the mess you made. No one who isn't a member of the cooking club isn't allowed in the kitchen. They must remain in the seating area. He looked up and gave a room a quick once over before continuing. And rule number five, don't plagiarize anyone else's work. You will be immediately kicked out and banned from any competitive clubs. So, pretty much all of the clubs then. Cool beans. Not like he's ever been the type to cheat. One thing he and Izumi's friends happened to share. Aoi Senpai. I finished cooking the sausage, shrimp, and chicken. He said to Aoi who was working on the Alfredo sauce. After Chef Shiraki finished explaining the rules he dismissed everyone to do their own thing. Though he did have to elaborate that they are allowed to make their own lunches. That's what they are doing. Most of the first years had left after being dismissed so. Only they and most of their upperclassmen are still there. And it turns out that Italian food is considered a type of European cuisine so. Aoi asked for them to team up and make themselves lunch. He also ended up convincing her to make extra for Shinso. There's no rule saying that they can't give some of the food they made to students outside of the club. Plus, he's been making lunches for Shinso since the first day of school. Shinso took a liking to his food, and it makes him happy to see someone openly enjoy his food. Ah, okay. Let me add it to the sauce. Could you grab the containers? She asked. He moved the bowl of the finished meats within her reach as he grabbed the disposable food bowls. Shall I cut the garlic bread as well? He asked, grabbing the knife. You can cut it up. He sliced the bread into three slices as AoE started plating their lunch. Okay, I'm done. I'll see you tomorrow, Izuku. 
Aoi waved at him before running down the hall. He looked down at the plated lunches and walked to the garden behind the gym. There's a small field of cherry blossom trees behind the trees. He and his friends have been using that place as their hangout area during lunch since the first week. As he walked closer his mind wandered back to the possibility of telling Shinzo about what happened. He did tell him a little bit before on their first day, but he wanted to tell him more but was nervous. He was able to easily spot Shinzo's purple hair against the pink and white petals of the cherry blossoms. He wasn't surprised by the lack of the blonde and black hair of the rest of their friend group. Toga and Tenya were in a meeting, while Momo has a cold and Nito has a doctor's appointment. So, today it's just them. A perfect time for him to come clean to Shinzo. How long are you going to stand there? I'm hungry. He jumped to see Shinzo staring directly at him. He couldn't stop the smile that appeared on his face. He's happy that Shinzo is comfortable enough around him to ask questions without fearing his reaction. I got your food here, Shinzo. He walked over and sat down beside him. He handed Shinzo his lunch as he looked at it in confusion. It's warm. Heh <laughs> heh, I joined the cooking club. So, me and Aoi Senpai just made it a few minutes ago. He looked at him even more confused. Aoi? Oh, he forgot that Aoi told him to call her by her first name today. Roku Senpai, sorry. She told me to call her by her first name. A look of realization appeared on his face. So, she joined the cooking club. Shinzo opened the tray and stared down at the Alfredo. What's this? A sausage, shrimp, and chicken Alfredo with a slice of four cheese garlic bread. He saw the way Shinzo's brow furled. It's Italian, not Japanese. Ah, makes sense. Um, how do I eat this? I've given you food that isn't Japanese before right? You have but. Those were handheld foods, like burgers, hot dogs, pizzas, stuff like that. Oh, here. Let me show you how to use the fork. So, what was bothering you earlier? Shinzo was now leaning against the tree after devouring this lunch. Note. Give him more Italian foods in the future. Huh? What are you talking about? He asked looking over at him. When you first got here, you were deep in thought. You looked like you were contemplating something important. And then reality returned to him as the subject of how to tell Shinzo came up again. I, um, why was it so hard to say? You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Shinzo quickly added in a panicked tone. No, I wanted to tell you this for a while, but it's hard. He looked down and took a deep breath as he planned what he wanted to say. Do you remember what I said to you on our first day about why my favorite hero is a racerhead? Shinzo's expression looked like a mix of confusion and seriousness. Yes, you never elaborated more but you implied that he rescued you from a bad situation. Most likely a kidnapping. He said in a hesitant tone. He felt relieved he came to that conclusion. A month ago you told me about your situation after getting your quirk. Your bravery and the level of trust you had in me left me feeling guilty. I wondered if I didn't trust you as much as you trusted me. Even after all the time we spent together the mere thought of talking about what happened leaves me unable to even open my mouth. Then don't force yourself to talk about it. Whatever happened left you obviously traumatized. You freeze up if an adult you don't recognize is anywhere near you. You are too scared to walk into an alley by yourself. And, he looks up at him, you have panic attacks out of nowhere and always think that no one notices you when you are standing right beside you. He listed as he looked back down. Was he that obvious? If so, why hasn't anyone outside of his mother and aunties seemed to realize that something was wrong with him? But, I want to tell you about it, and I feel the only thing I can do is to force myself to do so. But, there's so much that happened. Shinzo looked down with a frustrated look on his face. He stayed silent as his watch started going crazy. He had put Emily and Felix on silent when Shinzo wasn't paying attention. Emily will make him pay for it later, but he needs to do this now. If he waited any more then it would be 50 years before he tried again. Shinzo looked up like he had an idea. Then don't tell me everything. What? Summarize it without going into specific details unless you're comfortable with it, Shinzo said, looking proud of himself. That was smart, and it could work. He stopped and thought about everything that happened. He didn't want to describe everything. Maybe simple broad strokes would work as he suggested. After we found out I was quirkless my family started neglecting me severely. My mother has apologized for what she did once she realized it. But my sister and father are still the same. Shinzo had looked at him with a panicked expression at first, but calmed down a little after he added that his mother was better now. 
But, unfortunately before she realized what she was doing I had gotten kidnapped due to her negligence. Me and her were at a park near our house, and I was playing with a ball. I had dropped the ball, and it rolled away. Then I wandered into an alley, where a man handed me back my ball. Before I could return to where my mother was I had felt a prick on the back of my neck, and I had passed out. Shinso looked around uncomfortable for a second before pulling him into a hug. He closed his eyes as his eyes filled with tears, as he remembered what happened next. I. I. I woke up in a cage in a white room. There were four other kids in there with me, all of them also being quirkless as well. Shinso said nothing, just continued to hold him. T. They made the week, so much better. I feel like if they weren't there, I would have died on the first day. But, the adults there were so mean. They barely feed us, yelled at us, hit us whether we did something or not. It was horrible. He thinks about that week. It was only a week, but, he remembers it better than he does anything before that besides diagnosis. There was a schedule. I had it memorized by my third day there. And then on top of all that there was. The. The I. Why couldn't he say the doctor? Everything else came out easily. Don't focus on who. It was someone who hurt you badly right? Shinso asked as his hold got a little tighter. He nodded and tried to think of a way to talk about this without meaning the doctor. There was a man. He was the worst of all. He enjoyed seeing us in pain. I hate how much he has affected my life. Too scared to even go to a hospital, even if it's in my best interest. Too scared of the thought of getting a vaccine. Needles having been ruined for me forever. I was there for a week. A week. Before I made a mistake, and one of the guards died. This was good because it caught the attention of Midnight, Miss Joke, and Eraserhead who were nearby. Shinso tensed up. So, they rescued you together? Yeah. But. Eraserhead gives me more hope than the others because whenever I think of him, I remember him kicking down the door and tying that man up before carrying me outside and getting me and the others medical help before taking me home. And guess what? My family didn't even notice I was gone. Ha ha ha. He could no longer hold his tears. I suffered for a week in that place, wondering if they were worried about me only to find out they never once noticed that I had got kidnapped. They thought I was in my room. Why was he ranting about this? This isn't the main thing he wanted to tell Shinso, but why was this the thing he could talk about clearly? They weren't even home when I got back. They were at the hospital because Izumi had a fever and was exaggerating the amount of pain she was in. Can you believe that? Shinso rubbed his hand up and down his back. I want to say no but, after what I've been through I know parents can be some of the most horrible creatures to their children. And even now they still don't know. Shinso. My mother has been worrying about me going places by myself for the past year. But I could never find the heart to tell her that I was already kidnapped. Shinso didn't question why. But he could tell he did have a question. Can I ask a question? Sure. Why did they only take quirkless children? You said the other four kids that were kidnapped were also quirkless. Did not mention why he had gotten kidnapped in the first place. Oh, I guess I forgot to bring it up. We were taken because they wanted to figure out how to force someone with no quirk factor to manifest a quirk. Shinso's hand motions stopped. What? They, what's wrong with them? They, for that. His words were mixed up as he tried to get his words out before a quiet. Did it work? He nodded. All five of us had managed to manifest a quirk but I was always too scared to use it or even acknowledge it. Shinso did force anything after that. He pulled back a little to look at his face. Thank you for being brave enough to tell me this. He gave a tiny smile before he went back to his usual bored expression. Your face is a mess. He pulled out several napkins and started dabbing his face. This is why I carry around so many. You're going to make your face all puffy one day. How are your eyes not dried out? Shinso muttered to himself as he stopped crying. There, that's much better. He placed a hand on his cheek and touched their foreheads. Don't make yourself do something like this again. And I'll make sure you don't have to experience anything like that again. He muttered the last part under his breath with a slight blush of embarrassment. That is so cheesy, Shinso. He started laughing as Shinso later joined in. I agree. I'm never saying that again. Shinso shook his head with a sigh. Okay, now let's enjoy the 15 minutes we have left before we go to history. Shinso sat down, and he plopped himself on his lap, as Shinso hissed at him like a cat. They silently looked at their surroundings before. Now, you might want to put Emily and Felix off of mute before we go back to class. Oh, shoot. Emily had several choice words for him, 
but congratulated Shinzo for how he handled the situation. Emily then told him that he forced her hand, so she was going to send a short clip of what happened to Miss Nevermind, his therapist. He assumes he deserves this for muting them, but he knows that if he didn't then she would talk him out of telling Shinzo. Felix thought was being silent. He claimed to be making sure that being put on mute never interfered with his other programs. He glanced at his phone. His science class was almost over, and he turned in his assignments already so. It was okay, Tenya. He could tell Felix was there because of the green light that was glowing on his phone. Everyone thought it stood for charging for some reason, and he never bothered to correct them. He sighed, looking at the time again, still five minutes to go. He loved science, but it's a bit boring when you already know everything they're teaching. Luckily the school year is almost over. They are most likely moving him and Momo to a more advanced science class hopefully. The bell rings, making him jump. As he looked at the time again, it was finally three o'clock. He quickly packed his bags when Felix finally spoke again. The gymnastics room is that medium-sized building behind the school gym. He nodded as he waited to see if Felix would tell him what was wrong. I? I didn't like what you did. I hated being silenced. The basic code that you engraved into me was for me to look over the state of all your electrical appliances and relay any necessary information to you. How could I do my basic function if my voice was disabled? His voice conveyed how much the actions he took without any prior thought had negatively affected Felix. He bit his lip as he stopped walking to look around before sitting on a nearby bench and he turned the holographic screen on his watch. Felix's AI face ironically looks just like the face of Lee Felix with his freckles and ever-changing hair colors. Looks like today he chose blue hair. He isn't sure if it was because of how he was feeling or because he just wanted to wear blue hair, but he didn't focus on that. Felix was pouting and looked like he was going to cry. Felix, I'm so sorry. I didn't think about how putting you and Emily on mute would affect both of you. And to ensure I won't do it again, tonight I'll add a new feature to you. It will allow you to unmute yourself and Emily in the event I ever attempt to mute you ever again. Is that okay? Felix nodded. You better go, you're already five minutes late for your gymnastics club. Oh, shoot. He stood up and ran and Felix turned out the holographic screen. He ran to the gymnastics club building. From the outside, it looked almost identical to the gym. He realized as he walked up to the door, as a woman opened the door. She had yellow hair and eyes, and was wearing what looked like a leotard and leggings. Hello, Yagi, I presume. He nodded and handed her the slip. Okay, Noel is on the floor guiding everyone through the stretches. She wrote something on her clipboard, and he walked further in. Now it looked more like a gymnastics room than a normal gym. With all kinds of boards, bars, and planks spread around with the floors completely matted or bare. He turned to the left where there were lots of big pits with foam cubes in them. That must be the area for beginners. Over there was a small group of kids, both boy and girl with a man with foreign features standing there. Ah, welcome young one, come come, the man said once he spotted him with a smile. You just got here in time. I was about to explain our stretching routine to the class. He sat down near the back of the group and turned his attention to his instructor. So, today we are planning to not only go over our stretching routine, but to get everybody's measurements now rather than later so you can get your uniform sooner. He waited to see if everyone got everything he just explained. When he got no objects or questions he smiled and continued. Okay, so we need you to place your school bags and things into the cubby with your last name on it. If you decided you wanted to remain in the club by the end of it, then leave a little note detailing your preferred name and it'll be changed by Monday. He walked over and placed his bag into one of the pink cubbies that had Yagi written on top. He left his phone in there, but kept the watch on. The school knows he can't take off his watch for safety reasons. He walked back over to where he was, but he stood there at attention like most of the students were doing. There were only maybe 10 to 15 of them here so. Most isn't a lot, but it's still most. Okay, I'm Noel Laurent and this, the woman from earlier was walking over to them now. Wakita Mako, and we will be your gymnastics instructors until you either quit, transfer schools, or graduate. Wakita Sensei sighed. Laurent is his surname. Not Noel, sorry. He's still learning Japanese customs. Oh, so he's a foreigner. That makes sense. Now, as Lawrence Sensei guides you through the stretches, I will call you all away one at a time for measurements. And if we finish the stretches before I'm done, then we might start preparing to teach you guys how to do a few beginner skills. The way Wakita Sensei spoke was firm and stern. He sounds like Lawrence Sensei is the fun teacher while she is the mean one. 
Lawrence Sensei claps with a bright smile. Okay now, all of you spread out into five lines. Yes, Muva looks out. Great. Now, who's first? The question was directed at Wakita Sensei, who only looked down at her clipboard. Emi and Asahi. Two girls from the middle of the second line left and followed her somewhere. So, I need you guys to raise your arms, yes like that. Now rotate them clockwise, Lawrence Sensei said, while he also demonstrated what to do. They did as told, and after three minutes he told them to do it in the opposite direction. Good. Now put your arms level with your chest, and turn your upper body to your left three times, and then do the same thing on the right. So, it's a start on the upper body type before traveling to the lower type of warm-up. Good. Now bend over and touch your toes. Now sit down on the mat and open your legs. As they did as he asked, Wakita Sensei returned. Seiki, Tamaki, and Ake. There appears not to be an order to the name she called, maybe when they arrived. Lean your body to the left. Now lean to the right. Now in the front. He swore he heard the sound of someone's bones popping when they leaned down to the front. Good, that's all. Lawrence Sensei stands up and turns to them. Now I have to ensure that you guys know the warm-up routine because you won't be allowed to participate if you don't do it. He heard a few kids groan, but he didn't make a sound. The warm-up was very simple so he had no problem doing it more than one time. Great now, from the beginning. They continued doing the warm-ups on repeat as Wakita Sensei came and called kids away under Lawrence Sensei's watchful eyes. He was about to repeat it for the fifth time, when there was a tap on his shoulder. Lawrence Sensei was there with a smile. Good job, you can sit by the cubbies until I come over. He nodded and walked over to the cubbies where there was a current total of four kids standing there. He felt refreshed after the warm-up and it looked like they did as well. He sat down and looked back at the other kids to see most were either giving it their all or skipping certain steps. He assumed that Lawrence Sensei was watching and looking for the students that were taking the warm-up seriously. So, one of our older members offered to help teach you guys some of the beginner skills while I work on the kids with the warm-up. Lawrence Sensei explained after he brought four more students over. He nodded while a few others gave a verbal response to what he said as an older girl came over. She's wearing a similar outfit to Wakita Sensei, a burgundy bodysuit and white sweatpants. She had braided black hair that was pulled up into a bun and blue eyes. She had a kind smile on her face as looked at them. Are these the only ones taking this seriously? Wow, why aren't you guys taking the warm-up seriously? She said with a snicker as Lawrence Sensei smirked. You say that like you weren't one of those kids when you first joined. Her face flushed in embarrassment. This is Aikmi Yuzuha. She's one of our students going to nationals this year. Aikmi Senpai gave a small bow before leading them to a small mat. So, what do you think we are going to learn first? They all looked at each other before one of the boys answered. A handstand. Maybe a front flip, one of the girls said as Aikmi Senpai looked a little disappointed. To balance on one foot, he asked. He's heard before that at the beginner's level. You don't do complicated things so. He named something simple. Aikmi Senpai nodded with a smile. Greeny is correct. Handstands are not as simple as you think it is and flips are absolutely out of the question at your current level. Though technically, I was planning on teaching you guys the straddle first. She explained with her arms crossed, still smiling though. So, sit down. Spread your legs first and try to keep your toes curled. He learned that spreading his legs with his toes curled is hard for some reason. He was eventually able to continue at it while his forearm was on the mat so he made good progress. Yagi. He left the straddle the same way he saw Aikmi Senpai do, leaning up and closing his legs before he used his arms to lift himself before turning to see an impressed Wakita Sensei. I did the same thing I saw Aikmi Senpai doing. He explained walking over. That's still very impressive especially if you just copied her. Someone who's a level 5 gymnast. They walked to a separate room that looked like a nurse's office. There was another woman there. This is the school nurse, Sakura Ai. She's going to take your measurements. He doesn't know her. He doesn't know her, and he's supposed to let her get close to him. I... I've already had a discussion with Miss. Never mind, Izuku. She briefed me already on your situation. She leaned down with a smile. I'll try to get your measurements all from the front all right? She asked in a kind tone. He wanted to relax, but he can't force himself to. Oh, and make sure to tell me if you need a break. Okay? She tilted her head with an eye-closed smile. He nodded. They never allowed him to tell them to stop. But what if he tells her to stop and she doesn't? He didn't want to delay it any longer so he nodded. Sorry but, 
Can I have a verbal agreement? Yes, you can measure me. She luckily moved quickly and efficiently, but she did look a bit worried after measuring him. You are a bit underweight, and it says on your file that you are also a member of the dance club as well. She looked at him with the look his mom gives him when he accidentally burned his hand on the stove. It made his throat tighten up. You're going to need to eat a lot more if you plan to remain in both clubs, Izuku. We don't want to pass out in class one day due to being malnourished. She said, writing something down. I'll call your mother to notify her that you need to eat a lot more food. She turned around and started muttering to herself, and he took that as a sign to leave. He walked out to see Lawrence Sensei standing outside of the room. You can go home now, it's almost five o'clock. He nodded and went to get his things before he left. Good to see that I don't need to tell you that you would not be able to sustain this lifestyle with the current state of your body. So you need to start eating more today. Go and eat some foods with lots of calories while you hang out with your group of kidnappies. Emily said with a giggle as he ran to the school gates. He didn't even give her a response, but he will do as she said and eat more food where they end up going. He picked up his pace as he neared the gates. He could see four silhouettes in the distance. Ah, uh, there he is, Azami said as he got closer. Did you have a good day, Izu? asked Katashi as he stopped in front of them. He nodded. I had a serious talk with a friend and had fun at the clubs. She nodded pleased with his answer. Amiya wasn't though. A friend? Who? Come on. You can't leave us hanging. He couldn't help chuckling as headed to the train station. His name is Shinso Hitoshi. We met at the science fair, which he won second place in. She nodded looking pleased for about five seconds. Were you first or third place? First, I nearly had a panic attack on the stage. Correction, you did have a panic attack on the stage causing Shinso to have to use his quirk on you to get to breathe properly. Emily, helpfully added. Akihiro gave him an unimpressed look as the other looked at his watch in confusion. Wow, lying about your health, and then getting tattled on by one of your advanced eyes? Shame on you. Why are you not freaking out about the fact his watch just spoke to us? Amaya asked looking at his watch like she expected an alien to crawl out of it. This is Emily. She's an AI I made. Felix, hi. Is the first one I made. They got me into Saume. Oh, Amiya said. Katashi and Azami both looked like they got over their surprise. It appears they were more shocked by Emily talking abruptly than her talking at all. Akihiro, how come you knew about his eyes? Akihiro shrugged his shoulders. My mom was one of the preliminary round judges. He gasped as it all come together. I knew something about Mrs. Masajiro was familiar. That's why her name seemed familiar to him. She was Akihiro's mother. He then remembered the look in her eyes when he introduced himself. She must have realized who he was. Ha, huh, now I feel guilty for not being able to figure out who she was. Akihiro snickered as Katashi patted him on the back. I doubt we would be able to figure out who your mother was if we met her too. My father maybe but, mom. No, you'll know immediately that she's my mother. They had the same hair color and eyes, they cried the same, and she was obviously where he got his intelligence from. Which would be more apparent by taking a single glance at his father. If Izumi was born blonde with his eyes, then she would be the perfect carbon copy of him. Like how Katsuki and Su Katsumi are perfect carbon copies of Auntie. Not a single trace of uncle can be found in them. Ah, so what have you been up to since the day we were reduced? Amiya asked. I've made up with my mom since then and our relationship is way better than before. No hope for my sister and father yet. He answered as he smiled. Good, I'm glad you and your mom made up. Akihiro replied as he remembered that he was the one who originally told him his mother hadn't forgotten him. What have you four been doing since then? Well, I started going to therapy and found out about my love for watering Azami. Azami choked as the boys laughed. Ahem. What Emaya meant was that enjoys using her quirk to randomly splash me with water. Even though I told you, I'm not a flower. She said the last part while glaring at Amiya who only giggled uncontrollably. Well, I can't let you overheat and become dehydrated. And I have to make sure you don't pass out in the winter, too, Akihiro said as he put his hands in his pockets. Ah, so, you guys started training your quirks? He asked as he remembered that Azami had a flower quirk. Amiya had a water quirk and Akihiro had a light-based quirk. Yeah, I mean, it was a shitty situation but we have to at least make the most of it. Azami said with a frown. Wait, I'm not judging you guys. I actually find it very admirable that you guys were able to make those quirks your own despite how we got them in the first place. 
He explained himself as they all looked at him confused. We didn't think you were judging us, Izu. Why would you think that? Katashi asked as he looked him in the eyes. I, I don't know, maybe it was the subject specifically. Or the fact that, unlike you guys, I haven't been able to bring myself to use my quirk since. He looked down as he grabbed the front of the vest, tightly in his fists. Emily was silent for some reason. Recording or contacting Miss Nevermind perhaps. Someone grabbed his hands, and he flinched before looking up to see it was a Kihiro with a sad look in his eyes. Izuku, we aren't going to force you to use your quirk. Just like we are allowed to use ours despite how we got them. You're also allowed to not use it for the same reason, how we got them. He squeezed his hand lightly. Just because someone else is doing something you're unable to or is struggling to do yourself, doesn't mean you need to force yourself to do it as well because they can. That's only going to make the situation worse, especially if trauma is involved. Azami walked closer and rubbed his back. Feel free to move at your own pace. We don't want you using your quirk if it's still hard on you. She continued as Katashi smiled. I mean, it took Amaya a whole year after the rescue to even attempt to use her quirk, and it was because Azami's aunt got a little too upset causing Azami to quickly become dehydrated and she passed out. He explained resulting in a glare from Azami and a squeak from Amiya. He closed his eyes as he felt the presence of his friends, and he almost burst into tears. He held it back because the train had arrived. He thought about what they said on the ride back to District 4. Emily also sent him a text saying, Miss Nevermind rescheduled his appointment for tomorrow, and had already notified his mom who agreed. He held back a sigh, but he understood. Emily most likely already told her about what happened with Shinso, and how he intentionally turned Felix and Emily's voices to keep her from talking him out of it. As they left the train station he stopped and called out to them. I thought about what you guys said. Thanks, I needed to hear that. Katashi laughs and wraps his arm around his shoulders and pulls him into a hug. What are friends for? Sugar mommies and daddies. Free stuff. To call out your stupidity. Encourage bad behaviors, everyone else answered looking at Katashi who groaned. Come on guys. He grumbled and started walking off. Hey, where are we going? He asked as he started walking faster. There's a cafe nearby that plays songs from the pre-quirk era. And it isn't covered in hero merch. It's simple and cozy. I think you'll like it. Katashi explained, and he perked up. A cafe that plays pre-quirk songs? Do they have stray kid songs? A cafe that plays pre-quirk songs? Do they have stray kid songs? There's a pause as he realized what happened. Felix! There's a glitchy laugh as Amiya appeared to have realized something as she started laughing harder. Felix, hum. She raised an eyebrow as the other three looked confused. You didn't happen to have to base him off of a certain pre-quirk era Australian K-pop idol. Felix laughed even harder as he felt his face get hot. I have no idea what you're talking about Amy. So, his deep voice? That's just how his code came out. His Australian accent? I have no idea what you're talking about. If it helps, I could show you guys my AI face. Okay, fine. I might have based him a little off Lee Felix. He was defeated. He didn't really expect anyone to know about stray kids since people only learn about things from before. Quirks are either students in a history class or historians. Yeah, Anarchy, I think he's going to like that cafe just fine. We can even spend a little extra to request a few songs. She said, linking their arms as she started dragging him. He heard Azami sigh. Great. Another K-pop fanatic. The cafe looked nothing like a cafe from the outside, to him at least. It looked more like either a shop or a hotel lobby from the outside, but the inside looked completely different from the view outside. He wonders if it's someone's quirk at work or something. They ordered already, and he ended up ordering six things as he felt Emily glaring at him from inside the watch. He looked around more, and the cafe was called Ordinary. It fitted the name already if you couldn't tell from his earlier comments. The seats all had a red and blue pattern on them, with the wood bits being painted purple and yellow. The walls were green, teal, and pale pink. They were a weird color combination, but it worked for some reason that he couldn't understand. He heard a faint thump and looked up to see their server. He said to call him Bibakari. Weird. But he seems nice enough. So, put in the song you guys want to listen to here. He didn't sound too pleased. He assumes that's because other kids and teenagers would change it to things of the modern era, where songs are mostly about people bragging about their quirks. Okay, Izu, you heard him, Azami said, passing the keyboard to him, which he took with a small thanks. 
What should he put on? How about easy? He typed in Stray Kids Easy and was happy to see it was indeed there. He smiled as it started playing on the speakers. Wow, I thought you would choose side effects or maybe maniac. Amiya said in amazement as Bibakari seemed to brighten up. I didn't think people even knew this song. Hying. You won't believe this. He ran off towards the kitchen as they looked at each other in confusion. That was Korean right. Katashi shrugged as he drank his mug of hot chocolate. Hey, Aniki. What club are you in? He found himself asking out of nowhere. Dance, fashion and painting. How about you, Akihiro? Dance, drama, and I think I might try out for gymnastics on Monday. Oh, oh, me too. I was originally in dance, gardening, and sculpting but I'm not steady enough for sculpting so I might try out for gymnastics as well. Inside voice, Amiya. Azami scolds her, and she drinks a cup of Earl Grey. Why did she want tea again? And before you ask, I am in the same clubs as Amiya, except for the last one. She sips her tea as he looks at them expectantly. So, they get no. Make sure to eat enough calories speech. No, because I know they will eat more than enough to make up for all the calories they will lose, Azami says pointedly, and he feels offended. Don't bother trying to argue with her, Izuku. You know she's right. He huffed as Emily once again came out and exposed him. Why does he keep her around again? He sulked for about five minutes before Amaya put on Mirror Mirror. He forgot why he was sad. And before he could remember why Akihiro put on I'm not cool. Overall, a ten tenths. He plans to return soon. And as if reading his mind Amiya spoke up. Hey, Aniki. Why don't we make this our meeting spot? She asked as he looked at her confused for a second. We could, and it would cause fewer arguments, and since we all know where it is so. He walked off looking deep in thought as Azami asked for his phone. She typed a few things on it before handing it back. He looked to see he had four more contacts. Water junkie, who has to be Amiya. Spirit bender, he snorted at the reference. It clearly has to be Akihiro. Gaia, he smiled. It had to be Azami's nickname. And, finally Natsu's and Jura's love child. Was this supposed to be Anaki? Jura can move and manipulate Earth last time he checked, but isn't his quirk to make barriers? Unless he learned how to make Earth barriers. You have one new message, Gaia. All of our numbers so, you can contact us anytime. He smiled at her. Thank you. Anyway, it's getting late. Bye everyone. See you on Monday. He waved at them before running home. He was so happy to see them again. As neared the house he saw Izumi and her friends standing outside, but he ignored them as he ran into the house. It was a quarter after six at this point so mom was most likely already home. He can't believe he's been gone for over twelve hours. It's almost a little unreal to him. He found her in the study on the third floor. Izuku, how was your day? Did you like your club so far? It appeared today was a rapid fire round, though he knows she's most likely doing this to hide how worried she was. It was. Good. I love my clubs, and I reunited with some friends I made about two years ago. He ran over to her as she pulled him into her lap. That's good, Izuku. I almost had a heart attack thinking you had been kidnapped or something. I'm sure Emily would have immediately told you what happened. He heard her huff, but he ignored it. His mom laughed. Yeah, I suppose so. But a mother always worries. She started patting his head, causing him to realize how sleepy he is. Mom. He yawned, but he had to say this before he went to sleep. This might be the no armal. Time I come home. E. From now. On. And he was out. So raise your hands if you did not put in your votes for what we should do for the fair. Tenya their class president said as Miu. Their vice counted the votes. A few hands were raised, but he tuned them out as he felt Amiya playing with his hair. It was the new term and Amiya managed to make a high enough grade to get put in their class. He's proud of her. She was upset by the fact he was in a class without any of them over the summer last year. Anaki was as well, but, in her words, Anaki is a big boy. He can be alone for a couple of hours. So, she spent the remainder of the school term studying, and all of her hard work paid off. She was trying to put it into a small bun, as it was long enough for it now. Over the last two years, his hair had been steadily growing, but he was too focused on other things to cut it, and since Amia won, and his mother liked it, he decided to let it continue to grow out. So, 10% voted for a cafe run by Izuku, 20% of you voted for a photoshoot, and 70% of you voted for a wedding. Miu said after calculating the scores, what was the first thing? They wanted him to run a whole cafe? 
Mac, he could have asked Mr. Kangaroo for help if it had one. So, a wedding sounds interesting. He swears he's going to find out who keeps coming up with all these ideas. And it looks like the bride has already been voted for. Um, she looks up, directly at him. A sense of dread suddenly overcomes him. No, it can't be. So, 100% of the votes were for Izuku to be the bride. You have got to be kidding me. 